<laughs> Let's get it going. Ba, 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 ba. What's going on, guys? Today on the Poker Life Podcast, I'm trying these introductions, introductions differently here. I'm going to start, say it first. We're joined by one of the top tournament players in the entire world, currently ranked number 10 on the GPI Poker Rankings. Three-time bracelet winner. Just took down an online bracelet event. The other day, perfect timing. We already had the podcast scheduled. It's great. Great for business. Great for her. <laughs> great for everybody involved out there. Uh, very long time poker player was a former supernova elite on poker stars which means that she is a very insane sick volume grinder then transitioned more to tournaments and listen the tournament success has been coming in strong i think uh, a lot of people out there look up to her in the poker world and i'm very 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 excited to finally get her on and uh so today's poker live podcast my name is joe one aka chicago joe you can find the podcast on itunes i've been doing a lot of content this week on doug polk first day in a ground that uh, i mean kristen you seen anything about that she may me you see a that? Little any, a little bit. A little bit of bit. that? Yeah, maybe we'll... I haven't, yeah, I need to catch up. Yeah, do you? I mean, it looks I funny. Know. You might need to, you might not. I mean, tournaments are kind of taking priority right now. A lot of big series are going on. So we're going to talk yeah. all about that today, guys. And uh, that's really all I got. Tomorrow, I'm breaking down a World Poker Tour, the Potlum Omaha final table that I did commentary on earlier this week. And I'm going to be doing commentary on all of these World Poker Tour final table championship events. They got a bunch more coming up. The event goes until September... Eighth, I believe it's a long time, and I know Kristen's fired up because she's currently on top of the leaderboard for that. Of course, why wouldn't you be on top of the leaderboard for that so far? But we got a long way to go fifty thousand dollars up top for that. So, welcome finally, Chrissy B, aka Kristen Bicknell, to the show. Kristen, I feel like my intro for you could be about uh, <laughs> about like a, a, a 30, like a 20 minute intro because I feel like you've done a lot in the poker world over these past That's 10 amazing. plus years. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I, it's uh, exciting to be on. I feel like I made it. I feel like this is the Joe Rogan podcast of poker. So yeah, I'm excited. Well, technically, I, I've known you for a very long time because we, we used to play back in the day on <laughs> stars at the Florida Nolan Holden tables way yeah. back there before I switched to the beautiful, the great, the lovely, the great game of Potlum in Omaha, of course. And uh, yeah. And yeah, so you, so we used to play some back in the day and you're still at it strong. And I mean, you're getting even stronger and stronger <laughs> with these results. Like your, your tournament results, when you go check them, like they, each year that you transition over, they go up, they go yeah. up, they go up, they go up. You, you've won the multiple time for the, uh, the GPI female player of the year. Of course, you've been number one. I see you at the awards, always, uh, always dressed up, looking nice. And, uh, yeah. Alex, your boyfriend taking down the GPI male. I mean, you guys are like the power couple in poker right now. It's really cool to see. And I think a lot of people out there look at what you're doing and say they find it very inspiring to to see the the amount of success you're able to have online and live now yeah and as you know i think the the thing i always like to point out is like we're just playing all the time and throughout all the success there's so much failure and so much <laughs> struggle as you know and it's like what you were saying about us playing the same games i guess it was like how many years ago now 10 yeah like 10, 12 10. 10, 10, 12 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I, what what year what year did you start playing on Poker Stars for the for the Nolan Home Holmes cash games? It must have been 2012 or so. I got uh, I got Supernova Elite. I think the first time in 2013. Or does that make no sense? When was Black Friday? Black Friday was 2011. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, it was it must I must have started playing like 2008 or two or even earlier. I guess. Yeah, I, th I think it was about then. That's when I started back in 07, yeah. 08, kind of started the 10 cent, 25 cent full ring tables. I, there's still a lot of guys yeah. left from that, like Tim Stone, you know, Vinny Vici, these guys all sort of yeah. rose up the, the full ring ranks about that time. It seemed like you kind of stuck to one, two, two, four, and you were just mass tabling, 24 tabling, 18 tabling, getting supernova yeah. elite. And we're like, who the, we're like, who the hell is this, right? Like, do we know who this is? Like, is Chrissy B? Because normally you, like, you, if you see a screen with a, like a girl <laughs> screen name, you're like, is it a girl supernova elite? It's just kind of, we didn't, a yeah. Mr. Y was another one from Russia. We didn't really know much about her. And then we saw her and we're like, we're like, where do these people come from? Like, what's their stories? Yeah. Like, how did they get into this? So like, what what inspired you to take the supernova elite grind? Because there were only a few hundred psychotic people who decided to say, hey, I'm going to get a million points. And yeah. uh, I mean, it was it's great reward, right? Because you're making $100,000 before, but you didn't have to win at the game. It was kind of amazing yeah. of a deal back in the day. But what even inspired you to get down the, the supernova elite rabbit hole here? Yeah, it was huge for me, uh, 100K a year at that time. I honestly, I feel like, like you said, psychotic people, there's a bit of a sickness we have to have, like definitely type A, like to do things. There's like, some sort of, I guess, excitement or enjoyment in grinding. And I knew that I always had that. Like once I, the first time I played poker, I played like a 12 hour session. 
And I just like, you couldn't take me away from the poker table. It was like, how do I stop playing? I'm like, what? It's 5 a.m. I have to leave. Um, I've always been like that with poker. So when I found out about, you know, Supernova Elite and like, oh, I just need to get volume in, like, that's easy for me. I have no struggle with that. Like, I don't want to do anything else but play poker. Mm -hmm. So it just seemed so perfect for me. I think at the time I was struggling playing MTTs. I was playing maybe like one of nines and under, you know, uh, dealing with the tournament frustration and, Obviously, I probably at that point didn't even know how bad I was at poker. So I wasn't really getting that much success in tournaments. And it just seemed like the perfect thing for me to do. And it was, it was honestly the, yeah, the grinding part was the easy part for me. So it, it just kind of worked. Yeah. That's what I always said, right? I'm like, you're like, yeah. you're going to, you're going to, you're going to give out a hundred thousand dollars to play hands. I mean, oh, <laughs> no. yeah. I got, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and See, then you, you can kind of build a strategy out from there to, to break even or slightly win. I mean, at that time I was somehow winning 24 tabling. So yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure you were, you were winning too, right? I want, I, the first year I did it, I think I had a small loss, which probably, uh, stemmed from some like 36 hour degen sessions. Yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. But, um, the second year I did profit doing it. And I don't really remember the numbers, but yeah, those, those yeah, like, it was always those big, big degen sessions where you go, I'm going to play a little bit extra tonight. Those hurt yeah. your overall yearly win rate. If you lose like 20 buy-ins, you know, all of a sudden so you're much. not, it's like, yeah. I have to say, I've always felt like a strong connection with you because I feel like I remember, you know, the lobbies, I remember the people who were there, like, you know, at 4am at 1pm, it was like all day. You know, there were some people who were, you knew they were like responsible nerds and they'd never be up at 5am but I can know that like you or Tim Stone or someone like, you know, there's a good chance I'll see you in the lobby. And I knew, I knew that we had the same sickness, if that makes sense. Oh yeah. And I love seeing your graphs of like, you know, <laughs> the struggle sessions. I just relate so much. So <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I'm the same. Yeah. I think there's like the, the anyone that got Supernova leader around that time, you know, you kind of like have like this, this respect for them right away because you know yeah. that they are just some, insane people who just like love poker, love playing, love putting in hands, love putting in volume. And you're right. I mean, I would play all the yeah. time. My sleep schedule was terrible. I was yeah. up playing 12 hours. I would always post my graphs too. And I yeah. shared plenty. We don't share, we don't see too many people share losing graphs these days. I would love sharing my losing graphs. Cause I'd be like, ah, I played a 12, I played a, you know, I played 16 hour session. Like I put in 25,000 hands and I lost 20 buy-ins, you know? And I'm like, ah, yeah. you know, it could be, <laughs> at the time and most people are kind of they don't share that same vulnerability these days because they don't want to get made fun of or put down or sure, they yeah. want everyone wants to be thought of as a really good player but i i, I didn't mind kind of sharing those uh those, those struggles back then and yeah. i guess over the years for yourself so you did that for quite a long time i was actually surprised when i see you pop up i think i saw you pop up at some live tournaments and i was always like oh so she's gonna it makes sense right because if you can beat the one, two games on poker stars, full ring. Like you're probably yeah. going to go to live poker and you're gonna be like, Oh wow, this is a lot easier than that. And second of all, you're gonna play tournaments and you're gonna say, Oh, wait a second. This is just playing a long session. And then the players yeah. are slightly worse. So it's like, Oh, okay. Well, this is, well, yeah. So yeah, what happened with that? I mean, right before I transitioned to live, I was playing like one, two and two, five zoom on poker stars, which is like, they really are the toughest games. And, um, I mean, I started dating a poker player who was more of a live player um and kind of you know started playing like the bellagio 510 and realizing like oh my god i'm playing 510 and this game seems way softer than one two online mm -hmm. and and i kind of liked the aspect of being there in real life too i think that i mean i really like being a female in poker i think that it's it's a really fun dynamic to play with um and there's something i don't know that that feels really fun about sitting at a poker table is like, you know, this kind of little innocent looking girl <laughs> and kind of surprising everybody with how I play. Cause I feel like I don't play as people think I would. Um, and so it was just really fun when I got to see like high stake, like high stakes to me, you know, five, 10 and 10, 20 cash games was pretty big mm -hmm. at the time. And I started having some success in that and just kind of dabbled in the tournaments, had some success with that. And then, like got bitten by the tournament bug that happens, you know, you win a tournament, you're like, Oh my God, this is so fun. This is amazing. This is easy because when you win a tournament, it feels so easy and you forget, like, it's so hard to win a tournament. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I just, you know, loved going to the world series every summer and then happened to bank the ladies event. And then from there I was like, Oh, tournaments are fun. You know, they, uh, 
and yeah, just kind of slowly transitioned more and got lucky doors open to the right places. That's what it seemed like, right? It seemed yeah. like this, this progression where it was like online, play live, 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 and then live kind of took over and then, but, but then you're just kind of, eh, I'm done with cash games. I'm going full tournaments. Cause now it seems yeah. like you are just completely entrenched in, you know, no one, no one think, even thinks he has a cash game player now. And I'm like, well, I mean, yeah. certainly playing million. how many, you, you probably, you probably play more hands than me. And I've never, I don't think, yeah. I don't think I know many people that I can say have played more hands of poker than I have. Cause I played about eight, 9 million hands, seven, eight, I, I somewhere between seven, eight, nine written there. I think you've more, actually played more than me, you. right? I think I've played like 13 or 14 million online. Right. Cash games. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and I feel, uh, yeah, it was crazy. I remember it was very, it's very close to Nananoko because I remember that we emailed, like I emailed to try to see what it was when somebody said what the record was. And I was very close. I can't remember the exact number, but I mean, I know it's like at least 14 million. That's so. a pretty in insane thing to be able to say. It's like, I, I, yeah. may, I, I may, I may, I may, there's a chance I may have played the most online poker hands. Of yeah. all time, maybe some of these like hyper sit and go guys, because these guys, oh man, I used to hate these guys, because these guys always could get the super double eight <laughs> so quickly because they just I racked know. up points through right, nah, nah, nah. Yes. And then they then Brett, I'd be like, oh, I think I could get it faster than you, and be like, oh, I'm gonna get it in a month, and then I'm like, okay, well, you can't guess, get that in a month playing hold them and, and playing PLO, so it's yeah. uh. And I started with a 10k bankroll playing 50 cent a dollar when I went to Supernova Elite, so it was pretty crazy. But... Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, honestly, I think that as a cash game player, you probably have the same thing. You're like, oh, tournaments are just like a crap shoot. You know, you have to win your flips and it's all about that. And once I started understanding like the complexity of tournament poker and how there's like so many things to master within tournament poker, like short, you know, how different playing like 15 big blinds is versus 40 big blinds versus 50 big blinds. And then, you know, the early stages and ICM. And I'm like, wow, tournaments are actually really fascinating because there's so much to learn. And I actually like, went from a place of really, I don't want to say disrespecting tournament players or feeling that, you know, oh, cash game player, you know, always respecting cash game players more than tournament players to kind of shifting to, to like appreciating, um, you know, how much knowledge a tournament, a good tournament player has to really have, I guess. And um, just, just kind of like, it's such an art being a good tournament player. You know what? And, yeah. 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 I've been studying a little bit. I'm come. That's a good way to describe it in art. I've been studying more now. I go, man, it's a lot more complex than I initially thought, right? It's different. Yes. Obviously we like cash game players are like deep stack, like river turn play, right? You look yeah. at that as this like majestic art form in itself. And then you go to tournaments and, you, and it's more of playing an eight big blind stack, playing a 12 big blind stack, ICM. And it's these like different concepts that are, once you start learning about them, they're actually pretty appealing. And yeah. it, it, but I can see when you, when cash game players, we, we look at tournament players, we'd say, oh, they're just winning flips, right? Like, ah, oh, you, you won eight yeah. flips, buddy. Like you're not that freaking good. So there'd be some sort yeah. of like, and plus a lot of tournament players got a lot of glory. They got a lot of recognition. They got a lot of attention yes. for their tournament, their poker success. And we're like, well, I mean, the guy's a losing player. He won a tournament. He's not even winning player. Like, why is that person necessarily getting, getting that attention? I mean, you could still say those things now, of course, too, out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. <laughs> and some people tell me these things, but yeah. you know, and, but when you start learning, it's fascinating, right? So now you, you're, you're like full tournament player now, cause you're playing, you're playing all, all the online stuff. You're playing the live stuff when yeah. you could play a live stuff. What, what are kind of the average, are you playing for buy-in wise? Are you playing like everything? What, what, what kind of, what's kind of your approach to it? Um, right now I, I kind of focus on anything from now just playing online. I'm playing like 500s and up, I would say for the WPT leaderboard, uh, anything 300 counts as well. So I'm playing the $300 tournaments for those, but I'll play, I would say typically I'm between like 500 and 5k. I'll play some of the 10ks that are going, um, you know, I'm trying to, the WPT has a 25k, 100k. I'll probably sell action and play in those. Um, but you know, I'm really comfortable around like the 1k mark, you know, there's some 5k tournaments going that I, you know, I play the 5k every week on party poker and things like that. But yeah, so it's, I guess you would call it the, the high stakes of online, except I'm, I'm sitting out the 25ks and 10ks a little bit. Mm. And so when you sit those out, is that because a function of bank, just bankroll, not wanting to play those, take as much of yourself, the edge isn't yeah. there, or what, what's kind of the thought process behind I, that? I would say both, but I mean, what is the bank really need for 25K tournaments online with <laughs> unlimited re-entry? It's crazy. It's it's like insane. I mean, you see the swings that people go on in 5K tournaments, right? I mean, the ROIs aren't very big, so it's going to, you know, the variance is massive. And um, 
yeah, I think it's always a struggle of like, how much do you push in poker? You know, as you increase your bankroll, it's like, do you want to keep pushing to move up stakes? And mm -hmm. you know, how much do I want to do that versus having kind of a little bit less stress right. with, with swings and variants. Cause I know on a Sunday it's like, you know, over 120 K in buy-ins or something. And how easy is it to brick one day of tournaments? And then you're like, Whoa, I just lost a lot of money today. Yep. <laughs> and, <you> know, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, maybe I could have like, you know, what if I only had 15 K in buy-ins and, you know, secured like a good hundred percent ROI in all the tournaments that I played. Uh -huh. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of a balance act for me. And I'm, I'm still trying to find my way of like, what do I want to focus on? What are my goals? How do I want to do it? You know, I'm definitely um, a little bit more conservative uh, in these tournaments that I'm playing right now than I used to be, I would say. Like, I, you know, there's always times to take shots and I've done that, but I, I just try to be a little bit conservative and cautious. You never want to, to add a lot of tournament poker. The variance is just insane. Mm -hmm. So probably the biggest it'd be interesting because yeah. kind of what you're saying right i could see some players right let's say they have 100k in buy-ins versus 40k in buy-ins it, it might intuitively say well, why don't i go higher why don't i fire more but yeah. maybe their mental game is better equipped to handle that that lower stress right the 40k in buy-ins versus this even if you backed or staked or sell an action for these yeah. things like mentally some people it just fucks them pretty bad so it, it's something that it seems really important that maybe people might overestimate. They just assume I need to ramp it up as high as I need to go. But then you yeah. kind of found these more conservative players who, who knew like, hey, a lower is, is my, that's my, my sweet spot. I'm exactly. fine not firing and finding all this value out there, even though there's so much value out there to play. Yeah. And it's, yeah, like different people have different mindsets, but you, it seems like you, you were kind of ramping up that risk for a while. And now you're saying, eh, you know what? A little less stressful kind of, kind of going back here. Exactly. Yeah, that makes Try sense. to just, yeah, balance it, find my way. Cause I do really like playing higher stakes and I love, I have a love hate relationship with high rollers that are really tough because in a way I love the challenge that they kind of provide. And I, I love challenging myself and seeing how I can compete. And I, I don't want to ever just sit out because I'm like, I don't agree with necessarily just thinking, oh, you know, Stevie Chidwick's the best player in the world and I'm scared to play against him. I'm not going to sit and play against him. Like, I like that challenge in right. a way. I'm like, okay, I want to see what I can do. And I understand that, you know, there's many tournaments where I, you know, probably don't have much of an edge if one at all, but how am I going to get better if I don't necessarily challenge myself? And it's just, I don't know, financial everything aside, I just think it's fun. And I think that I definitely don't try to like limit myself in what I can achieve. And I think that that's what you'll see, you know, with, with like Alex is a prime example of that, you know, so many poker players, I think they limit themselves because they're like, Oh, those games are too tough. Those games are too tough. But it's like, actually when you sit at them, you know, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. And mm -hmm. I, I just think it's a, it's a bad mentality to have because it just can set you back a little bit. And so I think just being smart about, how, you know, how do I balance that? Because I do love, playing like main events with a variety of players. I, I actually think that that's probably the type of poker I enjoy the most. I mean, the World Series main event is probably like the most fun poker experience ever, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, it's so fun because you can play with the best and you can play with amateurs and it's just like a good balance. And, you know, the table dynamic of playing with a mix of players is just so fun compared to, I don't know, you're playing with, eight of the best poker players in the world. It's kind of boring to me, actually. There, it, it, It's weird. It's just, anyways, it's, it's a weird thing that I'm, I'm trying to find the balance of like, where, where do I want to focus? So right now it's like, focus on my, you know, like the 1K stuff, the, that's kind of like my bread and butter. And then when I see a spot that, okay, this 25K might be good, mm -hmm. I'll sell action, take, the, take a tiny bit of myself, you know, be conservative, but play and, and try to see what I can do. I don't know. That's very interesting because what, what you're basically describing is how I believe you get really good at poker is by challenging yourself against these better players. Now, some players might take that idea and say they're losing players, right? And they say, oh, well, the only way I'm going to yeah. get better is if I play against... No. <laughs> I would say the way you get better is you, you beat the bad players first, right? If you can't beat the bad players, yes. you're not going to beat the good players. And there's, yeah. there's, there's no other way around it, okay? Yeah. That, that advice is more applicable for winning players and winning players want to push themselves to be even better and better. And not everybody's like that. They don't want that. They want soft games. 
some people out there like challenging themselves, right? I, I've always yeah. loved battling. I love playing against the better players. Yep. And sometimes that's the only players you get action from some of these some of these higher stakes. Unfortunately, unless you want to sit around all day and wait wait for wait for uh, wait yeah. for an antelope to come, as Rob Young likes to say, the antelope kaboo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. <laughs> they come walking by, and you're like, boom. Okay, so there are awesome. different approaches. I think at yeah. tournaments it seems easier because there's always these games there, and you can. Uh, yeah. All right, if you want to challenge yourself, you can say, okay, I'll play higher yeah. today, or I'm in the good mood, or I'm in a good state, or maybe there's a little extra value in that price pool, it might be a little overlay, might be some yeah. mains registered or satellite in that you didn't recognize, and then you say, okay, this this is this is a good way to challenge. And obviously the table draws in these things matter so much too. So they're huge, yeah. Isn't that crazy? I didn't I mean I, you know, these are like all yeah. obvious things, the tournament players, but when I played uh like my first couple PLO, like 10K and 25K PLO WSOP events. And I sit down, I look at my table. I go, you got to be joking me right now. I got like Sauce and, and Sean Winter here. I go, I'm looking around the other tables. I say, man, these table draws are are super important because you might get in a high stakes tournament and have the, the three weaker players in your game. I'm like, oh, this is like, yeah. now I'm now I'm really looking good. And I, I would imagine strategy might change in that regard too when if you get a softer table, maybe you're pushing some spots more. I'm not really sure. How, how does kind of the approach maybe differ in that situation? Yeah, it's really interesting. That that one of my first hundred Ks, I I actually remember this kind of thing coming up that I had a table that had one of the like businessmen on it. And it was interesting to see how some of the other regs would take advantage of that or, or wouldn't, because there was a spot where I had opened, I think it was hijacked with like nine ten off on his big blind, because I'm like, I want to play a pot with him. I'm in position and everyone. And it was interesting because like, some of the regs weren't adjusting to that. I felt like, like they weren't actually necessarily or not taking full advantage of the fact that we had this table draw. And because I think that in these tournaments, you definitely see, I think, sorry, one, uh -oh. I don't know something at the door uh -oh. but um what was i saying <laughs> the door, the door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah it is an interesting thing because all of a sudden you don't want to play a big pot versus a reg when you're like oh we got this guy over here right so it and you can kind of feel that at the table so all of a sudden it's like well then do you put a little more pressure on the reg who you know doesn't want to you know increase variance Definitely, against you yes. <laughs> right so and then the levels right that's why poker is so fun this is what makes i mean anytime yeah. you see a, you, like cash games or anytime you see a guy taking a shot I just attack him attack, attack, attack. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. especially when you know i mean this is why this is why understanding your ecosystem is so important like i try to know all the regulars all the guys right below that all the people all these sort of people in all these different spaces the different different kind of weaker players stronger players i try to know okay how are they potentially approaching situations differently it takes a lot of work and a lot of study a lot of mindfulness to be able to pay attention to all this and it does seem like a lot of tournament players, they, they sort of like to autopilot those first levels just because they want to try to get through it. And the, the mental energy they put into these later situations, like that's just sort of how they've approached their grind, kind of like autopiloting, which is what you see when you're mass tabling, you do the same thing. You build an auto autopiloting strategy, and then you might pull out the extra reserves and your energy for a couple bigger spots that you maybe need a little bit more time to think about. So you kind of maybe see that, it seems like at these tournaments too, where that's how a lot of players approach and maybe some players approach later stages like this too, because they're just so in flow playing that they don't put a ton of extra critical thought into some of the spots. Definitely. And I think that one thing that, you know, we were talking about short stacks and, and uh, being short stacked in a poker tournament. And one thing that really opened my eyes in the last couple of years is like, wait a second, how important it is to build stacks. So you don't get in that spot that you're all in mm. with, with a short stack. And, um, I feel like if anything, that's probably the number one thing I've learned from Alex. I think that's the, what he's really good at. Like if you see any main event, I feel like it's so rare that he doesn't just have like chip lead right away. It's crazy. Like he, he just builds stacks early because he puts so much pressure on people and he's always looking for those small pots. But what I got to see is like the difference that that makes in the mid middle stages or late stages because he's not all in a lot and like if you mm. can avoid being all in in a tournament that's that's amazing so all of a sudden that like 50 big lines he picked up early it's just created like such an advantage for the later stages so i think that you're right that like a lot of regs do autopilot these early stages of tournaments and uh one thing that i know like that i've really changed in my game too is understanding like battle for those pots like right away and how advantageous that can be for the later stages so now that would be, I mean, obviously that's, that's very interesting to think more about and think more about, okay, well then how do I implement this idea of 
building chip stacks early, right? Because like intuitively you, you might say, well, then what do you just start playing more hands? And well, then if you play more hands, theoretically, you, you probably aren't used to playing those Six. hands. So you're not going to do well playing these wider ranges of hand because that's what you would think. Well, how do you get more chips? Well, yes. I know in PLO cash games to win these 5K challenges I'm doing, I play a lot of hands and I play some hands. And if I was streaming the play, they'd be like, hmm, those might be folds, right? So it seems like you may end up in a lot of situations with some marginal parts of your preflop range in order to build these chip stacks. And now that's gonna cost a lot of players money, but I imagine there's an art to improving your ability to understand those situations, how to find the right spots, how to navigate that. But also yes. the, the rebuy system might help too, because you know, uh, if, I, if I do that, I can I can rebuy as well. Yeah, there, that can that can definitely help a little bit. But might help a little bit. I think, I, think, I think the art of it, I think that that's a perfect way to say it. It's just an art of, okay, all of a sudden, you know, I've three bet this guy, I bet the flop, and now we're on the turn. Like, maybe I'll shut down now. Maybe he has a really strong hand. Maybe this guy isn't the type to, like, battle right now. And mm -hmm. maybe he isn't blasting off with unlimited rebuys. So I'm going to check back. And, mm -hmm. like, just be, having the art of, like, knowing when to go and when to stop, right? I think that that's an important thing if you're you're gonna try to widen your free flop range and yeah it's just it's just such an art That's there's really it's really it. hard to kind of teach this in some ways too and i'm sure there are there are some ways you can teach you can you can yeah. learn this through a uh, very advanced study in terms of you know kind of working on some ideas that aren't necessarily thought of as optimal or or standard yeah. or gto right and i think uh that's what the struggle is to learn this game. I, I kind of look at it like live poker. The, the style that I, I adopted for online really works well at live PLO is because everyone's playing all these marginal hands. They're playing like that 35 to 65% of their range so often that, well, yeah. I go, oh, I'm used to playing this, right? This is like, <laughs> yeah. we're kind of, we're kind of, we're both at weaker ranges and I'm, and we're kind of in these spots where I just have a better understanding of what to do versus a lot of what these players have to do. Close flop. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I imagine that's what, that's what's going to happen in these situations too, is that you just yeah. end up in these uncomfortable situations, but you're used to navigating them and you're used to, yes. you're used to kind of understanding what to do and where to put pressure on. And then if you develop reads on these players, this is what makes the game of poker very fun, very interesting is these psychological yes. levels you take of, this is kind of why I hate anonymous poker. Uh, hate, oh, definitely. Hate's a strong yeah. word, but I, I'm, it's, it's easy. It's, I think it's really easy, but it's just so different because all those turn and river dynamic are, aren't necessarily at play. Playing some, for someone for three months isn't at play. Like that's what makes things really exciting and really fun to me is, is being able to use all those thought processes. I imagine totally. that you like that too. Yeah, I love that. And I think that, that for me, that's the real challenge. And when I'm like locked in with poker, I feel like I'm doing the best job I can at like, um, I guess, shifting gears, right? And understanding mm -hmm. my table and understanding my position. You know, is this a good button to open really wide or not? Who is this guy in the big blind? Things like that. And I think, are they playing um, with no names on site still? Uh, well, like for example, for Ignition, I played a lot uh, on Ignition. They have uh, an only anonymous. So it's just, it's so like the different, I mean, so different. It's like a different kind of world. Oh, look at that. Goddamn. Okay. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, there and, you go. <laughs> and then of course, run it once, run it once is anonymous as well too. So they're, and that's, Oh, wow. Yeah. They're, they're, that. They're, they only have cash games right now. They're developing sit and goes, but they're only for okay. cash games. I didn't know that. The Fox making an appearance back in the background. looks <laughs> like, he looks like he got done from a workout bench pressing 315 or something like that. We, like we just went to the gym for the first time today. Uh, it's been shut down until today. So it was a pretty exciting morning for us. Yeah, we, you've been you've been writing. Had our appointment at the gym. Yeah, you've been writing blog posts. One of your recent blog posts was about top five home workouts. So it sounds like you're deep into fitness right now, and you're deep into taking care of the mental state, the then kind of putting yourself in really good spots to be able to focus and not have a lot of other things on your mind. Yes, big. Uh, per, yeah, I definitely think that is really important, and I think it was during my Supernova Elite grind that. Yeah, actually, I got some money and I was like, you know what, I'm going to hire a personal trainer. And honestly, it was like the best thing that I ever did. And um, since then, I've kind of kept up with it because uh, like me and Alex were saying, like lifting weights, it honestly feels like, I don't know, like a drug, like a happy pill, like an energy pill. It's just it's like life changing. And once you experience that. So I hired a personal trainer. I was working out three times a week, did that for three months and committed to it. I was like, oh my God, I feel like, you know, 200 X the person I was three months ago mm -hmm. and just kept that up. And uh, yeah, for me, uh, so the last few months have been hard because it's not having a gym. 
and having to do the home workouts, but I've, I did what I could, but it's certainly not the same as like doing like a heavy deadlift. And, yeah, it yeah. seems like a lot of people used to, you know, they'd say, oh, to compete at the highest level now, you have to eat your green smoothies, you have to meditate, you got to take your cold showers, you got to go yeah. in the float tank, you got to work out. Whereas before it's like a meme, right? Before, back in the day, you show up, you have a McDonald's, you eat a double <laughs> cheeseburger and you'd show up and you, you could dominate. But now you got to take care of yourself a little more. Do you actually think that's true or do you do you think that uh, that isn't true? I think, I think that if you're looking on a daily basis, it probably doesn't matter so much. But I think for longevity, it really matters. And I think that like avoiding burnout, being able to like sustain a good pace. And I think just overall, honestly, like being happier. I think that that's the main thing. Like I know you've talked about it quite a bit, but like poker, especially online, like it can just be so lonely and depressing. And I think that it's a really good um balance for that just like your system hormonally like poker is insane what it must do to our brains you know like tournament poker is is drugs like the adrenaline the cortisol that you get it's it's insane and i think that so i think overall it's just gonna help you i guess be happier be healthier just like an emotional well-being state which mm -hmm. is only gonna help you in poker right and like like we were saying, we played together 12 years ago. I mean, how many people played back then that don't play anymore? Whether that might have been like, you know, they couldn't handle it emotionally or whatever it might be. But I definitely think that that's something that just helps me, you know, I like, but I definitely play better. You know, if I work out in the morning versus not working out in the morning, I, I definitely feel it in my session mm -hmm. and in poker. And I don't know. So yeah, I think, I think you can get away with not doing it um you know like in one day but i think that i don't know i just think it has lasting effects if that makes sense like i, I just think the compounding effects of like daily rituals like that are, mm -hmm. are pretty big so you might not feel a big impact you know until five months later if that if that makes sense right well i also can it can yeah. give you a confidence boost as well too. So when you start achieving results in the, in the gymnasium, whether it's through your diet and through your fitness workouts, and we hit those personal record points, yeah. it gives you a lot of confidence. It's like an easy game to me that you can play where you set a goal. Okay. I'm going to bench press 315, right? And then yeah. you, you hit that point and then you take that confidence, that process. You said, okay, how did I do that? Well, I was consistent. I challenged myself. I kept pushing. I got a trainer. I got a coach. Hmm. A lot of those things apply to poker. So that's how I've always approached. And that's how I approach the kind of stuff I do now. Yes. And when I'm struggling, I understand like, oh, I'm not doing one of the learning process steps here. I'm not yeah. challenging myself potentially, or I've got comfortable. And I think burnout for a lot of poker players out there, you know, we got a lot of unhappy players out there, Kristen, I'm telling you, they're like real, they're feeling some type of way about people sharing results. It's really funny. But I think a lot of that yeah. comes from burnout and just yeah. general unhappiness about your environment that you're in, your support system yeah. in place, yeah. your goals that you set for yourself, the ups and downs of your own success and, and sort of viewing other people and, and having some sort of contempt or resentment. And I imagine that having some other goals in your life, whether it's relationship wise or gym wise or education wise or finance wise, yeah. help you to avoid that burnout and avoid that unhappy feeling you have with the same grind over and over again. So that might be a good benefit of, of working out as you say, well, at least the poker's not going well, my workouts are going well, and I feel great, and I look great, so I still have yeah. that to fall back on at the end of the day. Yeah, and what I would say too is, you know, with poker, we're challenging ourselves so much emotionally, but I think what the gym and sports and fitness, I mean, you learn so much from all of those, but being comfortable with being uncomfortable is so important, you know, like those last reps that really hurt, to me, it like mirrors poker too, right? Like you have to, you. I don't know, to me, if you want to achieve great things, you need to challenge yourself and struggle and be okay with that struggle. It's like what you were saying about, you know, navigating post-flop and uncomfortable situations. It's like, if you don't force yourself to do that anymore, you're not going to improve at it or get better. And to me, it's like, you know, going to the gym and understanding like, wow, I feel like I, I can't lift this anymore, but then you can, you see the, you know, it's like you can fight through that mentally. It kind of like, you know, you can mirror that, in poker and in like two right like mm -hmm. like damn i just got smoked today i i played bad i lost a lot of money whatever it might be and just understanding like okay i can you know start over tomorrow and do better and i just think that 
I mean, that's what I love about poker. You learn so much about life, so much about yourself. You know, I think it like challenges you emotionally. And I think that the fitness side is just like a really good, um, I guess it's like a mirror to it. But I think the the physical exertion that you get is really, really healthy and beneficial for you. Yeah, it's, it's a good yeah. way to put it, right? Getting, uncom- getting comfortable with the uncomfor- uncomfortableness and kind of yeah. studying learning, you realize that once you hit that uncomfortable point, oftentimes that's why you don't know the answer to that question. So a lot of yeah. people might give up and say, okay, well, I'm not going to seek out the information on that just because it's hurting my brain so much to try to read. They're like... And actually yeah. sometimes, man, I mean, when I, I study a lot of crazy stuff. So when I study some real stuff that like makes you question your life, who you are, you get, you get really uncomfortable pit of feeling in your stomach and your chest and grinding through those moments to really answer some of the tough questions is kind of fun and, and find out answers for these things yeah. and seek out the knowledge yeah. information. You mentioned working out as well too. grind that obviously you work with a trainer and you can tell that because trainers teach you to be able to push through those last moments. And that's, what's good about having coaches. And I imagine that's, what's good about having a relationship with someone who's also, I mean, very similar you guys are kind of like very similar people where it seems like yeah. you know, both, both a little crazy <laughs> with the grinding, both into working out a lot, yeah, both into, <laughs> into having big, big tournament scores. Right. I mean, with Alex yeah. over there as well, how, how much do you think having that, that life partner benefits you in order of, of yeah. uh, the success that you have with these things? Yeah, definitely. And I think one thing to add is like the pleasure that comes with pain in the sense that, you know, you, when you push yourself in the gym, when you're like, damn, I don't want to work out today, but you make yourself do it, how much better. And, you know, you, you feel proud of yourself. You feel like you've achieved something after and you get, you know, all these like rewards that come up from that. And I think that that's one thing we definitely have in common that we both understand, like there's something you know, there's a lot of pleasure that comes in working hard and, um, and that we get that pleasure from working hard. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's kind of just like the perfect match in the sense that, uh, we definitely, you know, there's never any, I guess, uh, conflict about playing poker all day, every day, or going to the gym or whatever it might be. And yeah. So I know when I used to, have, when I was dating my ex-girlfriend, she was a pot Omaha player. When we went and played, it was like a World War II was going off there. We were going after each other super hard. <laughs> and and then, you know, that, well, of course, manifests later on at home. You know, we're upset. <laughs> you know, that's what it is, right? I'm not that's that upset. I wasn't that upset, you know. But when, after yeah. I kept stacking her over and over and over and over again. You know, to be fair, sometimes she got me a lot too. I, I can't say that as well. But, you know, there'd be like this real intense battle at the table all the time. Okay. We used to play games there all the time at home, all just battling all the time. So yeah. do you have that with Alex? Because you guys play a lot together. Are you guys going out? Is there like a rivalry? Is it intense? Like what's the what's the the dynamic between dynamic, the two of you when like, you play? I mean it's a weird thing. I would say I can't relate exactly to what you're saying because I feel that we're I don't know if it's like an innate thing that we are like really competitive with each other because obviously we are very like supportive of each other and want each other to do well. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we play, we just kind of, you know, have to play like it's any other opponent. Um, Yeah. I'm trying to think if we are competitive in any other ways of poker, Uh, like at home golf, are we, I mean, we definitely both hate losing. So (laughs) there's, (laughs) I think that that's fair to say. So there's definitely, it's never fun to lose to each other, but I think we just have to accept that it's it's going to happen. And <laughs> I think that there's definitely been moments that we can feel each, the steam coming from each other when we do lose yeah. to each other. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's an interesting thing. You, I think that we just accept, like, if we're playing first each other, someone has to lose. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's not the... I don't know. So I try to be, I try to be as like mature about it as possible that Mm. it it wouldn't come home to be in a fight or something. Right. But as kind of what you were saying, it's, it can be difficult. Well, I see, uh, I do see the person I was talking about in the chat right now. Shout out to, shout out to Poker Sashi's out there right now on the PLO Uh, grind list. I mean, Hey, you know, we all, we all know, right. In those battles of the games, you know, we know who got the upper hand. We do. Yeah. And I think that that's like, I mean, the, I think it's just a test of maturity, honestly, if you're playing with your like boyfriend or girlfriend, personally, uh-huh. because it's kind of immature if I'm going to be like, oh my God, you know, how, like, how did you stack me? Or like, 
why, you know, why did you do this or whatever? It's just kind of is what it is. Yeah. I, the first time, actually, the first time we stayed together in a hotel room when we first started dating, um, it was my first 25K and he busted me from it. And it's oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, this, this feels nice. But at the end of the day, like, what can I do except laugh about it? Like I had, I had a set and he had a straight flush draw. Yeah. It's just like, okay. The hand played itself. And yeah. I have, you know, this guy who's now staying in my hotel room happened to bust me from my first big tournament, but. <laughs> that had something to remember by. So yeah, exactly. It's a good story. And yeah. So obviously like... with you two being so close and playing together, there's been controversy, Kristen, which of course we have to talk about. So now there's some situations where you mentioned the whole entire America's card room thing where you guys aren't allowed to play on there together. So it seems like there's some been some issues brought up from people up there uh, about you two playing together and potentially outline activity. So what do you what do you think about that? And I talked with Alex before about that on my podcast. We addressed uh, yeah. the Doug Polk video that he made, and, and obviously he was very adamant in his stance. And and you two have been consistent with how you've handled that situation. So you know we're not we're not doing anything out of line here. Like we're playing we're playing the same way against each other as we would normally play against each other. There's nothing crazy yeah. happening here. Check the hand histories. So what are kind of your thoughts on that situation? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'm going to invite Alex over because I was saying I saw some people in the chat on Twitter asking you know for us to talk about this this situation. It's nothing we're trying to hide at all. But uh, let me, Alex, can you come over or no? Oh, you can't. He's playing right now. He's grinding. What time is the, it? Kid, the kid's an animal. Seven minutes till break. Seven minutes till break. Okay, cool. We, yeah, and he can come over and kind of explain the situation. But I, I think I'll kind of give like the lead up to it. Mm -hmm. um, when did I start playing on ACR? I think about last, maybe October. So less than a year. Um, started doing really well. Open a screen name. Open an account with my name, Chrissy B twenty four exclamation mark because someone took Chrissy B twenty four. Um, weird. and so obviously I was trying to, I don't know, the thing I definitely like about poker and as you know, like throughout the years, I've definitely been working towards, I don't necessarily know if, if brand is the word I would like to use. Um, but I don't know a better word to use. Establishing, <laughs> so say, establishing a presence for yourself in the community. Yeah. Myself as a player. I never, I didn't like the idea of playing, you know, being like a dark horse online player, you know, I have a presence, um, at live poker and I'm happy to share my online results, you know, as a part of me as a player, like whether it might be, I'm looking for people to buy action or whatever it might be. I just want everything out in the open. So anyways, I create this account. Um, I actually happened to do quite well in the like, whatever, seven months that I was playing there. I don't know if that means anything, but it, it means a lot of merit, a lot of Americans on that site, Chrissy, no shots yes. at Americans, but you know, I mean, yeah, you know, yes. So anyways, what, where it started was we got a request from ACR to show our setup. So we did that. I'm at my desk right here. You can see his little head, I think. Yeah. Mm. Or big head, I guess, but it's little, <laughs> but, um, so he's playing there. So we show a setup and they say, okay, cool. Because obviously it was clear that people were emailing, you know, his name was out Fox and you I'm Chrissy V 24 and we get on the same tables in some tournaments and I guess other players are writing into ACR being like, what the, you know, what's happening here. So we showed them this video, all clear, everything's good. All right. Then next, um, what happens? We get an email saying our accounts are suspended. We're like, what's happening? Alex speaks to his contact at ACR and she says, we're not necessarily saying that you guys did something wrong, but don't play in the same tournaments on the same IP. Basically, they're getting a lot of complaints from players, but they don't have any evidence that we're doing anything, I okay. guess, questionable. Okay. Here, you want me to just read what she actually said? Oh, sure, if you want to. I don't know if you can. Yeah. How? He, when's break? Uh, four minutes. Okay. He's going to read what she, what she told him, I guess. Okay, cool. This contact. This is just, it's been a really frustrating situation for us. Honestly, it caused a lot so of stress. Let me, let me get this, let me get this, let me see if I understand this correctly, right? Okay. America, America's I mean, card room. Long time now. We're not saying you guys did what? anything wrong with the poker. Community. I was reading it now, okay. Was you and Chrissy B24, and when you play together, this may be problematic. We only ask that please don't share the same event if you're playing from the same location. We do have a large offering of tournaments, which you can choose differently. 
Could you hear that? Yeah, yeah. They said don't play in the same location. We have this, we have a yeah. large offering of tournaments available. Yes. Okay. So um, one day when we're not in the same location, we get in the same tournament. And then within, well, no, actually we played for quite a bit. Anyways, within the tournament, all of a sudden, both of us get shut down. Like we get a During the saying, tournament. During, you're playing yeah. the tournament, different locations, the you get shut down. Like near the bubble. Correct. What'd you say? Oh. It was like near the bubble. Yeah, I was actually right near the bubble and I was chip leader, which is kind of annoying. And it was a 1K. So I was like, wow, I'm actually doing good in the tournament and I get shut down for no reason. So anyways, um, Alex messages... This, message that same contact. the same contact and she's yeah. unavailable at the time and he messages dan kent who was the current td at acr at the moment mm -hmm. and they have kind of a heated discussion um well the, the best is the first part i was loud. like hey man i have like an urgent issue uh and he was like it's not urgent it's, it's gg like saying good game like it's over and, and i was like, well, like he was like gloating in the fact that he he said he personally had me yeah, he personally so wait, 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 wait. was. Let me let me re, let me re say that. Let me make sure people. Understand, I understand that correctly. So, the former tur tournament, the tournament. Uh, I think it was tur poker tournament manager. The to what is it? What was his TD? name? TD. I think it's called TD. TD. Tournament winning director. TD. Right, Dan Kent. So he, Alex, got in touch with him, and he said, "No, this isn't. A, this isn't a, a problem. This is GG. You're done, and we got you. You're not playing anymore." Yes. Wow. Exactly. And uh, are you almost on break? Two minutes. Okay, cool. Um, and then what happened with your conversation with him? So then they kind of go into this whole thing and he says, well, this this other contact told me we just couldn't play from the same location and we're not playing from the same location. Like, what the hell? And we're mid-tournament. Like, you know, how much equity was I losing? It, it was just a frustrating situation. And so they get in this whole argument and he's like, what did he say? He's like, I've seen hands or... Yeah, he, he made reference. He said there was like one hand in his mind that was like so He's like, obvious or something that I, I and, but, he, but he couldn't tell me what it was. Yeah. He yeah. So he couldn't say the hand and he couldn't say what this evidence was. And we we're sitting there freaking out. Not, and if anything, you know, because of all the controversy of the final table that happened between me and Alex, mm -hmm. like we, if anything, we battle harder versus each other. And it's like, we understand that, you know, we're under a mag like a magnifying glass, a microscope that mm -hmm. like, we're not going to want to risk, you know, being banned from any site to like what maybe win a few hundred dollars or thousands, you know, we're both fine in poker. We don't need to, you know, risk our reputation and things like that mm -hmm. so we're like oh my god what the hell happened and i was joking to alex i'm like i don't know you time out a lot like did you time out aces versus me like i don't know what could have happened so we looked through all the hand histories there's like 450 of them that we have like and hold the manager together oh 600 sorry and there's one hand that comes up where alex had full made like a a borderline, like it's close. Like it, it's like a bottom range fold. You know, you could call, you could fold. It was ace eight off to like a shut, right? Mm -hmm. You showed it was forehand in a six hundred dollar tournament where you showed thirteen big blinds in the cutoff. I was the chip leader on the bottom of ace eight off, and I, I think it was in, in the exact spot that I would fold again against anyone. Uh, yeah, I, I don't but know. But, but yeah, now I'm on three. All right, he's gonna come over, and I, my speakers don't work, so you have to go in here. But um, so this is the one hand that we found. That was like remotely close, which like, I, I think that even saying anything about that hand specifically is ridiculous because I, I, I really think that most people would fold in that spot anyway. Uh, mm. um, so, so I actually went to look, sorry, I'm in the Always in hands up, right? This it's is okay. Like, we'll wait till, we'll wait till, love, come, we'll wait till it comes yeah. back over here, okay? So let me make sure I understand for these people hands. out there, sure. okay? So they, they shut it down in the middle of account. You guys go over your hands, about 600 hands. You can find one marginal spot where 13 big blinds alex has ace eight lays the hand down and that might be the one suspected moment you you look through there and say okay the only one that we thought maybe looks bad here just put left yeah, yeah. Come. Okay. what's up brother what's happening hey, what's, going <laughs> what's going on look at that hair kid okay look at that <laughs> need, need a, need a but, it's uh... flowing. it looks good it's flowing right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> But yeah, so 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 I I was like kind of like obsessed with this for a couple of days, where every every second that I had off, I was like going. I literally looked through every single hand that we were seated at the same table for on ACR in my HUD, which is like it records every hand that I played. And uh, 
I actually found, I, 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 I looked at the average pot size and in terms of big blinds, our average pot size against each other was 1.5 X, what my average pot size was against other opponents. So if anything, we play bigger pots against each other than, than otherwise that ace eight offhand was the e, like, I, I don't think there's anything questionable about it at all, mm -hmm. but that was the closest thing to something that seemed like maybe too tight. Uh, and I still don't even think it was, um, and I actually went even further to look at some of my other, uh, like, you know, I looked at, since I do, as Chrissy said, time out a lot. Like I found, I found five instances of me folding aces or Kings preflop to no action. And she wasn't at the table for any of them. Uh, and this was all obviously because I timed out with, with these hands. He plays like, too preflop. many tables. <laughs> uh, so it's just, it's it just, there are just so many elements of it that are, that are really frustrating to see in that. Like, I found evidence of me folding huge hands preflop where it's like clear that I'm, that I'm timing out or something's up, uh, that, that like there's either a connection issue or I'm timing out and none of them. I was not her. there. Yes. We've and then I looked through other. every single hand we played. Our average pot size against each other was bigger than my average pot size in general. Mm -hmm. And there's no questionable hands that I could find whatsoever. And I was really, really like, like strict with my analysis of what I considered questionable. And it, it it's just really confusing and, and frustrating because it very much feels like, and, and I get it to some extent that like, if people see us at the same table, it's natural for them to feel somewhat uncomfortable, I guess. The same way that I guess if you knew someone was like, you know, if two friends were living in the same house and you got three handed with them, like you, you, know, you don't know what's going on at their house. Nobody knows what's going on here, mm -hmm. but like you can kind of see like in, in here, like where I'm playing and we're like, we're both wearing headphones, both far apart. Both on many just, tables. But, <laughs> but I guess I guess what's frustrating about it is that it's clear that the sites are being influenced by player complaints, even though there isn't any evidence to substantiate these claims. And and I think that that's why what happened with Poker Stars, why we didn't get any kind of an explanation. They kind of said like a bit. I think it was like a business. I forget what they said. They said screening. we failed the screening, which Brian Mike Hunt's been vocal on Twitter so, in a lot of these. So my guess, my guess what happened with them is they basically decided okay even if there's no collusion going on or nothing off going on, mm -hmm. if, if three people don't register the tournament because of it. And I, and I assume that some of these people writing them complaining, were saying, I'm not going to play tournaments they're in. They're like, well, once we get three people, all of a sudden they're losing money by allowing us to play. Yeah. And they're within their rights to do what's best yeah. for their bottom lines. So like, also, I just want to add in the fact that we got all our funds from both sites, ACR and poker stars. And oh, yeah. typically in the history that when people are accused or I guess they've found evidence of collusion, they would compensate all the funds. We got everything back. So I feel like I it just want to say that it's clear there was no clear evidence of anything like right. that. that. Because, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I definitely think that's something that like like the air should be cleared on to some extent because it is it is it is upsetting that the players complaining is putting the sites in a spot where they're actually – in, it's in their best interest to not allow us to play whether we're doing something wrong or not and we're getting punished and, right and, and yeah it, i guess the comparison is we do we do know and then see plenty of staky backer relationships in these tournaments so i mean listen there's big stables out there at all stakes there's people that are staked that are coached that are best friends that are living in house that travel together we have all the sites have all the information on the back end to know these things yeah so it's not an uncommon thing, but it sounds like some people were a little bit salty about it. They were upset. You guys are both great players. And if, well, if we can get these two great players out of the regular pool who play every tournament, maybe we should try to do that. And it sounds like your influence with these sites isn't quite as high as the influence that other regulars may have with the sites. And, and obviously the yeah. sites can make decisions. It really does suck though, because this isn't like, a, a, you know, this happens as well too. This happens with stables. This happens with people all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And as Chrissy, I kind of heard a little bit of her saying before, like, I feel slightly obligated to that, like, I can't make an exploit fold against Chrissy, no. which is, which is, which is something yeah. that's like, you know, it's a, it's a bit, it, it's just like another layer of uh, frustration, of like unfairness, I think in, 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 in the, in the focus that comes from, that comes from this and that, like, I genuinely feel like it's like, I have a close spot that I think in theory is a call, but I actually think, maybe I think that Chrissy under bluffs this river, but I can't fold it because if someone saw, like if the site saw this with all these, with all these complaints, this is going to be evidence for them. Yeah. Even though I would make it, it has like, it has nothing to do with our relationship. It just has to do with my assessment of her play. The same way that yeah. like, 
against someone else, I might make a call that's crazy because I think they overblow the spot. Yeah. It's like, well, I mean, we definitely have get, spots like that every day. No, like, I know. Yeah. And, 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 okay. and we're both kind of handcuffed in that we have to play like neither of us, neither of us are just, you know, studying PO and following inputs and outputs for every single decision. That's not, that's not how either of us approach yeah. the game. Mm-hmm. But it, so, so, so effectively we, we have like handcuffs on when we're playing against each other and we have to play, we feel like we have to play a certain way because wanting to remove any potential for doubt of, of anything going on, which, yeah. you know, just, it actually ends up hurting both of us in, on, on, like, yeah. on like multiple levels. Yeah. Which is, and say like on ACR, it, it's just so funny that I feel like the reality of the situation is so different than what people imagine. Like we don't have any financial, like yeah, it's not, it's I'm not playing real. my own money. He's playing his own money. Like we, we're you not, know, we're, we're not, not married. We're not, we're, yeah, like, it, 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 it's, especially, yeah, it's like, there, there's no, like there's no incentive, uh, financial incentive at all yeah. for either of us. In, so it's in like, any of these spots so I would see, you know, when you see stables with eight people grinding in a grind house and one person has huge financial incentive of like everybody, it's like there's there's other situations happening here, but why do we have this? You know, we have we're under this spotlight because of this. Right. Situation. Well, normally, I'm, I'm probably shit. Bad. Yeah. Now yeah, it's timing out right. again. We'll talk soon, butter. Yeah. yeah. And normally in this situation, what happens is, is the higher stakes players have relationships with people from these poker sites, and they have the ear of these people at these poker sites, so they can easily say, "Hey, you know, here's what I think's happening." They might have more knowledge how the game works and they can explain things in a different way to convince the people that possibly have influence in these poker sites to make yeah. decisions. So, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to Dan. I'll reach out to Dan. I know he's not with ACR anymore, but I'll, I'll reach out to him. I've always looked at him as someone who was a spot at ACR that was trying to do a good job and that was trying yeah. to do things right and was trying to improve the site. Have you guys spoken with ACR CEO Phil Nagy? I know he's very vocal on social media and he, he's always keeping his face out there. Yeah, Alex has tried to reach out to Phil, but I don't think he's gotten back to him. We haven't yeah, heard. Him. Like yeah, he's wrote him like 20 messages. He's tried to speak out. You know, both of us have been pretty. To say that it was disappointing is an understatement. Like it legitimately had been quite a tense, stressful thing for like a couple months. And it it made me honestly, um, you know, with poker stars and ACR, it made me have this kind of sympathy of people being wrongly, wrongfully accused that mm-hmm. I, you know, I've never had that in my life before where I was being accused of something that is so against, you know, my character and something that I would do. And it, and it's so frustrating because it's, you know, ac- being accused of something that you're actively, like really actively trying not to do. You know, I understand I have a spotlight on me. I, you know, all of a sudden I have a, a potential bluff combo and I'm on the turn versus him. And I'm like, I guess I got to go for it. And like, I, I guess I have to call him here. I guess I have to do this because it's like, we understand. We just kind of, you know, now it's created the situation where we do just like battle really hard versus each other. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, we're actively, you know, not colluding and being accused of this. And, you know, anytime either of us has won a tournament, somebody's like, oh, they're cheating. You know, people saying, oh, Alex is, you know, helping her with her tournament or playing this tournament. It's like, it, it sucks and yeah. it's, it's upsetting. And, you know, not being able to play a poker site when we're just, you know, lovers of the game, we want to compete, we want to be out there. Both of us are, you know, like competitive and we're there with our screen names. You can see it's us. You can look at our hand histories. We'll happily share, you know, it's like, we're not trying to hide anyone. We're not trying to cheat. We're trying to win. We're, you know, both of us have results in tournaments and we're not just like at the same table. You know, we, we met playing poker. We met at the same, whatever, 10 K tournament and we happen to play the same games and just kind of, you know, been pushing to do that. There's only a certain amount of tournaments out there. I don't know the solution, you know, because yeah, that's what I I'm try- thinking, right? What's the solution, right? What is the answer in this question? Yeah. If, if a site makes a decision in this situation, right? What, ha- yeah. I mean, I guess the question is, is if I bring evidence to some of these sites, cause I'm more currently working on an investigation. I'm working on two investigations right now. It's pretty big. Yeah. One investigation may have to do with, uh, one of the driving forces of these tournaments out there, po- poker operator sites, which has to do with, uh, stables being uh the system in place is that a certain p- players take over of course when these counts get deep yeah <laughs> and I this mean, is happening a huge, at a big scale so huge scale right so yeah. are those people then going to be removed from the situation as well too i don't I, you don't know right maybe those stables have yeah. a relationship with the operator and that's this is unfortunately how it works yeah. is it's not necessarily a fair game in a lot of ways and a lot of it depends on the relationship but that's how it works in the real world out there too and that's yeah. how it works in a lot of industries 
for better and, and or for worse. You, how do you do that? And, you know, going back to what Alex was saying about us being handcuffed towards each other, you remember how we were saying going back, you know, you're in a hundred K and it's early stage and you know, there's tons of whales in the tournament, but you're sitting here versus whatever, all the best players. Do I want to play a really high variance line between, you know, if I'm sitting with Stevie on my left and I don't know, whoever else it might be, mm-hmm. all of a sudden I'm going to, I'm going to play a little bit past, you know, a little bit more cautiously versus them because I don't need to try to win their chips necessarily. But now I feel like I can't do that with Alex. Now I'm like, Oh, you know, I have ace King and need to like free bet and inflate the pot or right. whatever it might be. It, um, so, it sounds it sounds like ACR stole from you as well in the situation too because you're in the middle of a tournament. They didn't obviously have to shut you down in the middle of a tournament. Yeah. You're chip leading in the tournament. It sounds yeah. it, it sounds I mean this sounds pretty fucked up to me when I when I really think about it. Whether if they want to ban yeah. you or not for their own rules, I think yeah. okay we can have a can have an argument about that. We can debate that back and forth, but ultimately it's their decision. But to to shut it down in the middle of a tournament when you're doing well in there in a one k with with. You know, I don't know how many buy-ins are up top. That seems pretty pretty crazy to, to think about. Yeah, I was I was like to say I was upset would be an understatement. I was very pissed off, and I I think we're there's discussion of getting our buy-in back, but obviously with no like chip value of that, so just our buy-ins back, which is frustrating. Like I definitely had at least like 20k of equity in my chips or something. Like I was chip leader with I think it was like 18 left or something. Um, what was up top first place in that? What was first place? I can't remember. Maybe 40K, something like that. Yeah. Do you remember? Alex? Oh, now he's not listening. Um, but yeah, it was a, a messed up situation and made me realize, like, to be honest, it was a little bit scary because this is how I'm making my living and all these sites just have the control to like shut you down. And yeah. like, I'm risking, I don't know, I'm, I must have had a few thousand dollars in buy-ins that day on the site. And it's like, they, they have the ability to, you know, thankfully I got my funds back, but I did have like 50 or 70 K in the account or I think something like that. And then whatever Alex had in his account, like it's a big sweat and being like, I, you know, I swear I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. And like, potentially they have the power to just be like, well, we don't care. Like someone said this or someone said Mm. that. And as you know, like, look at a poker hand. If you want to tell the story that somebody's soft playing or, you know, I don't know, chip dumping, even though it's so funny. Someone said to us on GG the other day, we're chip dumping, but it was a spot where Alex had 15 or like 18 big blinds. I had like 40 and I three bet his open and he folded and they said, oh, chip dumping. I'm like, usually when you chip them, it would be the person with the bigger stack trying to help the shorter stack. I was like, I'm not trying to make like, well, couldn't they, they could just be saying this to rally you guys up too at this point, right? Obviously yeah. someone in the chat could just kind of say this as a Sorry. meme or as a, as a joke or as a, as a, as yeah. a troll or something like that, you know what I mean? Yeah, so. and he probably, possibly. So, so how, how yeah. do you how do you deal with this moving forward? Then I mean, it sounds like you keep playing your game, you still keep trying. I mean, maybe there are some ways to right build relationships with these operators to the point where you make it clear that nothing's happening. Because I mean, I guess the other option is not playing in the same tournaments, which kind of sucks yeah. because you guys both play the high stakes tournaments as well too. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough situation. I tried forever to reach out with poker stars. I tried to reach out to everybody I possibly could because I'm like, how how is this possible? I've been, you know, a poker stars reg for how many years? Even in the past, I had lived with my boyfriend. We played in the same tournaments. You know, it's it's a situation that comes up. I know other couples who live together play in the same tournaments. I feel like, you know, I go to all their live events and I'm like, wow, you really don't want me to play on your site like ever again in my life? Like, am I really never going to play a poker stars tournament again? It's like, I don't know It I know it, it sounds kind of like selfish, but it was like a big blow and really sad. And then it's like, well, do I go to live events if they let me go? Because in a way it's hard not to be bitter to, to mm-hmm. feel that I was treated unfairly and no explanation. I think that that's one thing I want to say is like the, um, on Twitter, I know when this initially happened, I, me or Alex have tweeted. And I think Brian Mikon, I don't know if you and know I know of, I don't think I saw this, but I, I know Brian. He, ex- he experienced the exact same thing. High volume player, um, all of this stuff. And it just said you failed a screening with no explanation. And it's, I mean, that part's just the most frustrating thing. It's like, yeah. what happened? What did we do? I know I did nothing wrong. And now I, I can't play there. So now, thankfully, you know, there's party poker, there's GG, and we play there. We play there with our real names. Everybody knows it's us. We always tried to be like that anyway. But I guess it's 
Well, I guess, yeah, I guess now you got you to gotta focus on the, the sites that you do have and the situation you do yeah. have. And, and maybe I'll look more into what's going on with this situation. Maybe I'll make some content about awesome. it, talk about the situation because it's yeah. not an unusual one where yeah. friends or family might be playing together in similar events. And yep. at what is it just if you if you and your boyfriend are both good at poker, like you guys can't play together on certain sites? Is that the rule we're making? Like, what are the yes, what are the rules exactly. going to be? Because this does seem like it, it could be unfair. Yeah. And I understand other people's worries as well. If I'm playing yeah. in these games, I could understand how someone would say, whoa, what's happening here? But yes. you know, it, yeah, like if I reg a tournament and I know like, you know, Liv and Igor are both in it and there's a chance that we all get on the same table. OK, well, maybe I need to then judge. Do I trust them? Do I think that they're, you know, capable of maybe trying to take advantage of the spot anymore? Well, mm -hmm. like I, I know them both like a little bit personally. I trust them for whatever it's worth. You know, I don't know them that well, but I trust them. So, okay, I'm going to play with them. Right. And it's like, you know, I don't know all the backing deals that people have with each other. I don't know, you know, everyone's financial investments. And that, unfortunately, I don't know how tournaments could happen in a way that we do know. You know, people swap in tournaments, people buy action. Who knows if someone's a horse of somebody. It's just this, this very gray area, right? Like, how do you regulate that? What do you do? And, right. and do you make a law that it's like, Okay, well, all of a sudden, I don't know, let's just say we were married. It's like you're married, so you can't play in the same tournament, but you can be a horse of this person. You know, sometimes people are in tournaments and like free rolling off someone else, right? Like yeah. it's like, you know, M I don't know. M, M Tomato's got a good idea. It's not, they need to have a public social media breakup and keep personal lives as personal as possible, <laughs> create some deniability. Hey, I mean, hey, uh, I hate to tell you that's what's happening right now out there is is people are aware of things like this might be happening so they just don't tell anyone what's going on so now you have a lot of deals being made in private and behind closed doors that you are not going to be privy to and that's the way you avoid it i mean listen i don't know if i'm yeah. dropping the strategy I, I i know people out there already know this but that's the way that you get around this is you just don't let people know and you don't get your platform or get your 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 the level of attention to that point yeah. But I mean, listen, this is happening in private games. This is happening in a lot of places. So exactly. the worry of it happening is real. It's just how then do you regulate that, police that, enforce that? That's the challenge. That's yeah. the challenging part to do. And I know it's a weak argument, but I just want to say it because it's like, I, I just hope that whoever's out there who thinks that I have any bad intentions, it's like when I opened my ACR account, me and Alex have been dating for two years. I literally picked my screen name. I wouldn't be so stupid to be like, oh, wow, we can take advantage of the fact that we're in the same tournament. Why don't I create a screen name that's Chrissy B24 so we can do this? Like, neither of us are trying to, you know, compete and be where we're at in poker by cheating. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I'm trying to win it's the just, right way. Makes yeah. yeah, it's just sad. And it, it's just, it's really insulting, I think. And it's, it's pathetic that I think a lot of people, you know, making assumptions, you know, the other day, somebody said, oh, uh, what was it? Jennifer Harmon posted something and she said, congrats to me. And he said, you mean congrats to her partner? Mm. Like what? Because I'm a female, clearly my boyfriend played my poker tournament for what it's worth. Anytime that I've had like, I don't know, a, a boyfriend or something around, like I, I've probably been in spots where I could have gotten help deep in a tournament, but I'm like, you know what? I want to do it for myself. Like mm -hmm. I want to make my decisions. I need to do, you know, I'm a poker player. I need to do this for myself. And I take a lot of pride in that. Yeah. And it's really frustrating that, you know, I know that people don't see me and they're not sitting there in the room seeing that, but like, I don't know. It's just a yeah. frustrating it really, situation. It, re it really is tough. Yeah. I agree. I mean, it sucks, yeah. right? It's like the way you make a living. So you've been working hard at it for a very long time. Yeah. You invested a lot of time in the industry and in the game. And yeah, I mean, it really, I couldn't, you know, it, it sucks. I, I could definitely yeah. empathize with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough, and when both tough of us spot put, for everybody. Yeah. When both of us put tons of work into poker and like, you know, legitimately like blood, sweat, tears, our lives are dedicated to poker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's just say like the final table, we got it together. Like we couldn't, we didn't get to enjoy that whatsoever because there was so much hate around us. And it's like, you know, it, it's such a shame, I guess. And, you know, to some extent, it's like first world problems but you know let's just say they're all they're all they're all important they're all important issues to the people that are involved with them right whether someone else sees it one way or the other and if it's a life or death or a health situation of course those are more important this person might die but yeah i think these are very important problems to you and very important things to you to help get figured out and i think that's what the podcast is here for to be able to talk about these yeah. things and see what people yeah. are working at so i'll take a look more at it i'll see what i can cool. do about yeah. the situation maybe i look into it kind of see talk with acr 
talk with my man Phil Nagy. You know, Phil Nagy's out there always trying to turn ACR into the top poker site in the world. So very awesome. curious to see what he's got to say about this situation. And um, But it sounds like from now, what we can focus on, we can focus on the tournaments you got coming up here. And look at me shifting away to a more positive topic. We're shifting away. So you got the World Poker Tour Championships, which you're still allowed to play on there. You're currently, hat. <laughs> you're currently on the leaderboard right there. And yeah. they got a lot of big events coming up. Rob, Rob's telling me like a lot of, there's a lot of overlay happening with these tournaments. So they can't get them filled up. Can you tell me exactly what overlay, what does that do for a player? So if a tournament has like a, like a million guarantee and it's 800K, filled up what is that how exactly does that do you explain the idea of overlay to people who don't know about it sure well effectively it's like you know say i invite 10 friends over to play a poker game and i say this tournament has a a million dollar guarantee and but the buy you only have to pay 100 bucks to buy in okay then all of a sudden if they don't have enough people to make up for that 1 million guarantee, well, the run, the operator of that tournament is still putting 1 million in the guarantee, in the prize pool. So now they're liable for whatever part of the prize pool that's missing. And effectively anyone that cashes the tournament will, oh, I mean, anyone that's in the tournament benefits, but um, the payout structure of the tournament will be so that, you know, all of a sudden, let's just say, you know, it overlaid by 200,000. Well, 200,000 was input by, you know, let's say party poker or me, whoever operated this. So they're effectively putting this money into the prize pool without, you know, players stacks being in play or anyone playing that. And it's just, uh, in a way, free money for the players. <laughs> and, you know, it, it makes your, your ROI go through the roof. <laughs> so as a professional, you're seeking out this overlay, it sounds like if you see a tournament with overlay, that's going to incentivize you to potentially want to play it more because you are making more money theoretically on, on average in these exactly. events. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. So, I mean, that's kind of what happens a lot, right? You see a tournament will be close to overlaying and then all of a sudden in the last 10 minutes, everybody jumps in and it doesn't overlay anymore. Ah, I but, see. But it is, yeah. So with these party events, they've been having a lot of overlay. And I mean, listen, they kind of made this schedule. I don't know what the schedule guys with the... I know they were trying to be a little bit unique with it and maybe it ends up benefiting them now, but they put the PLO eight week first, Pop Omaha eight, one of the least popular tournament forms of poker <laughs> in the entire world right now, only ahead of Raz yeah. maybe and Stud maybe. So that might have been at the gate, you know what I mean? I don't know if that was the slam that they needed. Then they had the Pop in Omaha, the great game. And listen, that was one of the tournaments that hit the guarantee. Shout out to Potlum in Omaha. The great games doing me proud. I appreciate that. I think it was only one of them though, but it is what it is. Now we move on to these, these Nolan at home tournaments. And I guess, is it just, is there a lot of tournaments going on right now? Because obviously we got the summer series, we got uh, World Series Poker, of course. So are there just so many tournaments out there that players are, are they're deciding that they don't want to play the party events or was it because they were PLO or what, what exactly, oh. what happened there? I think that one big barrier is all the regulations that are happening. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, they've cracked down. I, I don't know how to say this in a politically correct way, but um, the VPN usage for American players is no longer as easy as it used to be or, or possible. I think that, you know, um, I don't want to point fingers or anything, but obviously, you know, American players not being able to play on the site hurts a lot. And maybe other sites, you know, ACR, for example, it's legal to. And another thing is um, they've had to take away player to player transfers mm. internally on party poker. And I know that recently in a thread, um, I think Rob Young had revealed that in one of the high roller events, it was like 66% of the people who had bought in had bought in with funds that were like in the past done with player to player transfers. So people are having issues getting money in on in, I guess, yeah, on the site, I would say, I don't know about out, but um, you know, being Canadian, I know my credit card companies won't let me deposit onto the site. So um. it's just, I think that they're having some regulatory issues with um, the legal system that kind of sets some barriers for one thing. I think that there's been tons of series, you're right. Um, you know, there's, I think summer in general has always been a slow time for poker, online poker, at least. I know even for myself, like I'm in Toronto, the weather's nice here, like four months of the year. So mm -hmm. there's definitely more incentive to go outside and enjoy it. Um, it's, it's interesting. I'm not sure if there's a certain level where overlays are more prominent than other ones, but um, I think definitely there's probably, you know, some of the regs are 
burnt out. Who, who knows? Well, yeah. well, it sounds like what you said is a pretty, pretty big issue. The first part, right? No entire like yeah. you can't you can't deposit with with certain. I mean, normally you think right, you can you can deposit money here on like a little poker with a credit card. If you have yeah. that, and obviously ACR, you can do player to player transfers. You can do crypto. So it sounds like the the taking away the player to player transfer sounds like a pretty big deal. And I yeah, imagine if you have the stables and uh, the stables, they probably put a lot of players in through these player to player transfers, and that's a big disadvantage for these players in order to move money around. Exactly. So I know that that's been a huge barrier. And you know, when you have, um, I, I think that like. You know, I, I know personally more of the high stakes community. I think that, you know, on GG, it's easier to get cash and player to player transfers are very easy. And, um, you know, maybe people play in credit too or whatever. So it's just really easy to get funds on there. So all of a sudden registering becomes like, you know, a breeze versus how the hell do you get cash to register a tournament? Well, how do you play the tournament? You can't. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously playing on credit is how a lot of these private games run. Right, it's like you, yeah. you know, I, my agent. Shout out to my agent. Listen, my my <laughs> agent, Chris. Let me tell you about this agent guy. He's messaging me, sending me pictures at lobbies. You know, hey, there's six, wow. five, ten PLO running. You wanna hop in? And then he finally got me the other day. I streamed my play, and then he got me for a couple of days. You know, it's so much fun though. But I mean, listen, the whole credit system's pretty sweet. I gotta be honest with you guys, right? And of course, it's not yeah. sweet when you run up a big debt and you, hey, I'm in, you know, you're like, yeah, come yeah. on. You're like, okay, okay. It's like a credit card. You're like, wait, this is real money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but with the credit system, we don't usually see that on the more public sites. It's not. I, I know it happens, but. Yeah, so now I guess is that happened? That's what's going on with the GG stuff. Is people are able to play on credit there at the party and poker stars, maybe not or something? How does that work? I think so. I don't know exactly, but I, I don't think anyone, I don't think party poker, anyone from party poker is offering that. I could be completely wrong, but as far as I know, that's not happening on party poker. And rumors that maybe it is on other sites. Allegedly, sense. allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. Allegedly, there allegedly. we go. That's the word I will use. But I'm saying that I know that on Party Poker, that's a big issue right now that's trying to be, you know, be worked on and solved. Yeah, Par Party Poker really yeah. took a hit. I mean, I think what happened was is that Party Poker used to be a really great site back in the 2000s. It obviously took a hit over the next yeah. couple of years. It was, wasn't necessarily known as, as one of those great sites. Then new people came in, started taking it over, and they've had to rebrand Party Poker away from the image that it had for so long. That's a very challenging yeah. thing to do. So when you have yeah. a lot of these regulations in place and rules in place that you're not necessarily open to breaking, then it's going to be challenging to to kind of get the goals that you might want to see with you with your site. And maybe that's the issue is running. I mean, that really hurts when you got to rebrand the site away from like, oh, because for a while it didn't seem like Party Poker really cared about poker. And then all yeah. of a sudden they started caring again about poker. So yeah. when the customer has already, these longtime customers for us of the world have already been like, ah, eh, you know, like we checked out of there. How do you get those players back? Yeah. That seems to be a big challenge that they're facing in addition to the other things that you mentioned too. Software as yeah. well. I mean, some people would say software is okay, not okay. I, I haven't really played on there in a okay. long time. So I, I personally, I don't know about how the software is. What do you think about it on there? Um, yeah, I think there's lots of work to do. And I think Rob would be the first one to agree with that as mm -hmm. well. You know, I think that the one amazing thing Party Poker has right now, and I, you've had him on at least like once, right? Or Rob Young? Rob Young? Yeah, yeah a, least, three, a couple, like three, maybe three or four times at this times. point in time. Yeah. I mean, I think he's incredible. I think that, you know, having somebody behind a site that like the amount that they care about what the players want and you know, that they genuinely want to throw poker and run these amazing events. Like they're, it doesn't, I don't know. I think, I think he's incredible. I think that he would agree that the software could use updating. I guess it's not as easy as, as people would like to hope it is. I don't really know the logistics behind it, but I do think that there's a lot of room for improvement with the software. Um, and I think, unfortunately, it's just not that easy to, I right. Guess. What what happens no, to the software? Change it. Yeah, the software is normally developed a long time ago. So they develop like an initial version and they start adding code on top of that version. So then if you have developers come in and out, depending on who you're working with, it becomes really challenging because when you start fixing details in the code, then the code starts breaking and sometimes you yeah. don't really even know what it was. So uh, that's the real problem with the process we see. I mean, we see this with ACR and we see this with a lot of sites. Even GG, as they start yeah. to add more features to the software, they have more bugs and bugs yes. come up and they affect play. Tournaments have to be canceled. So there's a number of different things on that front. And I think all operators see that 
to some ex to some extent and that's why they wait they scale up their business they they kind of they, they maybe go slowly they work up the kinks and i think that's what we see with global poker a strategy they use right now so yeah. but these applications seem to have no problem i mean the, the phone yeah. apps they're running smooth i mean i don't know they yeah see, but they, they they so it's a real interesting world right now with online poker but you're mainly focused on the tournaments so you're probably just playing the, the bigger the, like the bigger tournaments the world series events and and the wpt events right yeah, I mean, since the quarantine, it's been crazy because we had all these events move from live to online and it's just been, it's kind of been insanely hectic in a good way because I, I love the grind, as I was saying, and there's just been series after series. So right now it's the WPT, the World Series. I don't know what's next. I don't know what's after, but that's kind of what I've been focusing on. So Who, who's kinda... your like nemesis for the for the leaderboard thing? So you get extra 50,000 if you win that leaderboard on WPT, right? Yeah, yeah, which is sick. I don't know who's um, close. I know Arthur. I don't know how you say his last name. Arthur um, Mar 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever yeah. it is. He's sick. Um, he's definitely my nemesis in general, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> but he, um, I think he's getting up there and he seems to always go deep. He's crushing. He's having a really good year. So what about like a Patrick He's... Leonard? I know he grinds a lot. Is he someone who, who finishes high on these leaderboards? That's a good question. I don't know where he's at. Me and him made a one K side bet. So I'm definitely ahead of him. I, I, I tried playing the PL. I played some PLO events. I cashed okay. a couple. Okay. So that helped. Um, I don't think he was in there though. So, but we got a long way to go. I mean, it's like it's it's another month and a week for the we for the events to come on, to right? A lot of buy-ins. You yeah. mentioned there's a 25k, there's yeah. 100k later on. So action's gonna pick up. It, it's gonna be, yeah. You know, I, I, I'm hoping to. I don't know, like as a regular, do you do you really want these overlays to get hit? I would think like you're like, eh, you know, don't come, right? I mean, it's kind of, yeah. It's a weird. You almost don't want to tell people. You almost don't want to say like, hey, uh, there's a lot of. Yeah. A lot of it value a, to be had in these things. Yeah, it is a weird thing. Cause like as an ambassador of the game and as somebody who wants to see, like I love seeing huge turnouts. I love big fields just in the sense that it shows that there's, you know, all these people playing the game and that poker's alive and running. And, you know, there's a part of me that wants to see great turnouts for that. But of course, like, you know, on the other side, you're like, oh, you know, overlay is not so bad for me financially. Mm -hmm. But I think overall it's great to see big fields. And that's, you know, it, it's fun to see really big turnouts. Well, I guess at this point, right, what kind of goals do you set for yourself after playing so long and with success that you've had? It sounds as if you have a couple levels that you might want to go up in the future. So yeah. how do you kind of, how do you approach that from a month to month basis? Are you just saying, yeah, how do you think about it? I mean, that's an interesting thing in poker and something I definitely uh, am constantly adjusting because, you know, you might maybe you're like, oh, I want my bankroll to get to this, or I want, you know, to do this with this money or something like that. And then you achieve that. And then you're kind of stuck with the like, now what? Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's something that's kind of always evolving. I think that for me, for the next couple of years, I wanted to kind of push myself to see how far I could get what, you know, that's like going after titles, doing all that stuff. Um, mainly, I think, uh, definitely motivated to like represent women in the game. Mm -hmm. And I think that like what you were saying, like a lot of attention is focused on tournament players. You know, if I was just trying to make money, I'd probably play cash games, but, um, I do feel somewhat of a responsibility, I guess, to, to represent, um, my gender in the game. And yeah. So I think for me, just kind of going after these titles and, more so, I guess, like the competitive side versus the financial side. Mm -hmm. But that's obviously I'm still playing poker for money. So, right. So you, when you mentioned being an ambassador for women, do you, do you, a lot of women reach out to you and they're asking you for advice and questions about things? Yeah, I definitely get like a decent amount of uh, feedback from other women players, which is really nice to hear. I think, um, you know, there's definitely a bunch of women's poker communities that uh, have been formed, which is kind of like cool. I, it's interesting because I, I struggle with, do we want to be separating ourselves so much? You know, I've never really felt that, you know, I don't really like ladies events. It's like, why do we need a ladies event? You know, I think that what I want to do more than anything is just lead by example, right? Like don't let yourself feel like you can't sit and play this tournament because I, you know, for whatever stupid reasons in your head, you're thinking you don't belong at a poker table. It's like, I just want to lead by example. Mm -hmm. So you just want to go out there, do things the right way, put your effort in, try to represent yourself and, and the community well, and, and 
hopefully people see that and they say, okay, well, what is she doing? And then how can I potentially follow that more? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you don't think there should be ladies tournaments? Because I, I guess from my perspective, I look at it and say, it seems like a an event a lot of women really love. So you get a lot of women who don't normally get to play events, who yeah. are maybe nervous or scared or just, right, that's, it's very, it can be an intimidating thing. Just like it can be intimidating for men out there too when they're thinking about going to the casino. It isn't necessarily exclusive yes, to, to one gender that, or the other. Exactly. Right? And that's what I wish, that's what I find like, my frustration in that attitude of like that women almost like accept that as you know yeah there's lots of guys who might feel intimidated walking into a poker room you know based on their experience or you you know if you're sitting down in a 100k high roller like probably every guy is intimidated you know we're all experiencing some level of that so i think that like yeah why are we making that gender specific and then like kind of almost like growing that even further. I think that's where the mistake lies. But that being said, I do think like, I don't have a problem with them being run, but I, I would like to see women feel a little bit more confident and comfortable to just, you know, understand like you saying that you don't feel like, I don't know, comfortable to go play with men or something. You have power to shift that feeling within yourself and to handle the situation a little different. It's like when I was 18 years old, I was going to casinos, sitting down and like dealing with whatever nonsense might come up at the poker table. Mm -hmm. And you can do it. You know, there's no, we're playing in establishments that like usually the floor is good. Usually you have other people, you know, there's always outliers and always terrible situations that come up, of course. But like at the end of the day, we can't just avoid it like avoid some bad apples because or sorry let the bad apples like change the whole experience and say like oh i i don't feel comfortable going to the casino to play poker it's like fuck that yeah <laughs> so know. what advice would you give to women out there because I, I i don't know if this is a common uh viewpoint you have because i talked to a lot of people out there talk to women yeah. talk to men and you certainly hear a lot of reservations because guys say some fucked up shit at the poker table. I've I've heard it before. I've seen it. It's just like you hear stories. I know my yeah. girlfriend used to tell me stories about her, and I was always like, "Well, you know, I, I want to be there. I want to see when these things happen because I might freak the fuck out, right?" Because I remember one time, you know, I feel yeah. like someone disrespected her a little bit. You know, I mean, I got a little maybe I got a little crazy about it, right? So I, I good. I, I I I mean, I don't know. It's a little what it was, but. What advice would you give the, give women to deal with this? Because it's I like what would you say if some guys like in your face and talking a bunch of shit? I mean, even for a man, that that could be something where a lot of guys don't want to be confrontational. Yeah, and I know people in general don't want to be confrontational just because they don't see the upside or some bad things can happen. Sure. So, what would be the advice for for the women out there? I think you know, depending on the situation, um, looking to you know, hopefully authorities, one thing that I'd say, and I, this is more to the men is, you know, I've been in these situations where somebody was a little bit rude to me or, you know, been out of line. And thankfully other players at the table chimed in. And I think that that's something I really like to see is like other men kind of, you know, there is biological differences between men and women, you know, men are stronger. There's a threat there, right. That like, a, a it's a little bit more difficult for a woman to stick up to a man in the same, you know, it's just a weird sort of uncomfortable situation. It can be, I think just being nice and being rational and being reasonable, you know, if you're doing that and you have, hopefully you're in a public setting that there's other good people around to like, you know, watch the situation and kind of handle it. I think that, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's like get thick skin and deal with it and don't engage. Don't, um, don't let it, don't let it prevent you from doing what you want to do. And at the end of the day, like, I feel like that sort of bad behavior happens a lot at low stakes, mm. especially. And from my experience, it's definitely been from, let's just say a losing player who's like, you know, a mad gambler. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think just understanding like, okay, you know, how you would in life when someone's reacting badly, it's like, that sucks for them that they're dealing with this anger and dealing with all these emotions, but like, you just have to ignore it, you know? Yeah. It's like that, like, unfortunately some humans, it's like that. Like today, I don't know, I turned, uh, I was driving and some guy gets so mad because I'm like in his way and I'm like, sorry, sorry. And he doesn't want to look at me and he's just being an asshole and he's all pissed off. And it's like, why do people do that? Like, it, it's just frustrating. So I think just, just own your, the power that you have, 
to react and mm-hmm. do the best you can. If someone's being shitty, that sucks for them. But, you know, we just, whatever, whatever you can do, like look for support from the people around you. And it's not like, it's not like when one guy's acting like a piece of shit in a poker room that everybody's going to be like, he's doing the right thing for the most part. You know, if you make noise about it, everyone's going to be like, like, buddy, get out of here. Or like, what the hell are you doing? And I think that's awesome that you stood up for your girlfriend at the time. And I think that like, you know, it's, that's all you can do is stick up for yourself and put them in their place. Yeah. I mean, I don't see too much. I'm always trying to look for this out of line talk where someone's putting someone else down and someone saying things like that. So I I don't see too much of it. Luckily, I, you know, I was, you always wonder what would you say in that spot or what would you do in that spot? And sometimes you say, yeah. Hey, chill out. Right. Sometimes you're in your own world. You don't want to be confrontational about it too. Yeah. And I mean, I'll be honest, like, I haven't experienced a, like that many bad situations and I've played a lot of live poker. I, I feel like allowing yourself, I think that sometimes I see women get upset about things that I'm like a little bit confused about too, because I feel like what happens is they sit down at the table and they're a bit uncomfortable and all of a sudden it's like anything that might sound bad, they're interpreting in the worst way possible. Like if someone says like, oh, like I, I don't want to fold to you or something. It's like, I can get mad at that. But like most of the time when a man says something like, I don't know, like, oh, I don't want to bust you, you're cute or something like that. It's like, they're not meaning a lot of harm. Like it's kind of a weird thing to say. And, and they're always telling a- me that too. They're always, they're always saying, listen, <laughs> listen, big, a lot pop, listen big poppy, you know, we will, we, we, I'll check it daddy. I'll check it. Thank you. You know, yeah. you know hey, listen, hey. <laughs> See, and that's the thing. It's like, I just have the attitude. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Cause like, maybe, maybe that helps me in poker. And I don't know. So I think that sometimes women take things that aren't meant necessarily negatively, even though they're, they're not appropriate things to say. It's like, I don't know, to some extent, like lighten up. I, I feel like I've seen some people react to things that they clearly weren't meant super negatively. I, it's a weird situation. Yeah, I mean, I see because obviously I see I talked to a lot of women talking about girl, but Kenny, she, you know, I, yeah. I talked about these issues. I hear how she feels about these situations too. So I, I just yeah. hear about a lot of sides of the stories, and I mean, it makes sense. You obviously you got you're very mentally tough, right? You wouldn't have made it this far and had success yeah. in poker. You don't have a lot of success in poker without being very mentally tough and getting over adversity, shaking off negative things, just overcoming it, trying to stay positive, trying to stay on track. Yeah. So that's yeah. like, I feel like a viewpoint. I'm not surprised to hear that you have this stance yeah. on the situation too. I mean, the part that really frustrates me is when I feel like my intelligence is automatically assumed to be like at this cap because I'm a female mm. or that, you know, I'm a female player. So I'm that like, when I first played with Alex, I was like, oh God, like I kind of felt thought he was like an asshole, like a sexist asshole because he's three betting me like crazy. And I'm like, oh, he just thinks I'm a girl. I'm a terrible player. And he's like attacking me. And that's what? the thing that I hate. I'm like, why do what, you know, why is there this assumption that I can't be good at poker if I'm a girl? Mm. And I just use that to like fuel me to be like, okay, now I'm going to beat this guy. Like if some guy's like an asshole to me at the table a little bit, or I can tell that he's thinking I'm like a weak spot. I'm like, all right, let's go. I'm going to get you. Interesting. <laughs> so I like to kind of shift it to that. And like, it fuels me. And that's what fuels me is like, I want to show that women, you know, can compete and can win a poker and can be good. So that, so ha- think- that happens. People are three bet. They'll three bet you more because you're a girl. Oh my God, my first 10K I ever played at PCA, I open under the gun and some guy threw that me was seven, two off from the button. And I'm sitting here thinking like, how is that profitable? And at first, because, you know, I didn't have results in, in poker and I probably didn't have as much confidence as I do now, I was like insulted. And it's a situation where you're like, wow, that feels really uncomfortable in a sense. Cause you're like, this guy thinks I'm that bad that three betting me with like seven, two off is profitable. There was no seven, two game happening. Like what the, you know, what's happening here. Mm -hmm. It's like a little bit insulting, but you just have to learn, like, you know, they're just going off gender stereotypes and like, how do you take that and use it to your, so it it got you out of your zone a little bit. Is that what you're saying? A hundred percent. Yeah. When I was younger, I didn't have, I wasn't able, I mean, there was some arguments that happened. Don't get me wrong because it's like, it fuels you. I mean, when someone's basically saying you're a female and to me, that means you're stupid. It's like hard to not feel triggered. Whoa, right? that's a far jump. Just cause the guy threw at you with seven deuce doesn't mean he thinks you're <laughs> stupid though. But this is what some, but this is how some women feel when they sit down at a poker table. Ah, this is what I see, I the see, environment that's been established. I right. See. And, and the way that some guys talk to you, it, it could feel like that's what they're saying. But again, 
we can't just, you know, there's mind reading going on that's probably not happening. And I think that sometimes that's what's happening when these women think like, oh, this guy was like rude to me or being condescending. Maybe sometimes he wasn't. Maybe we're misinterpreting it sometimes too. Yeah, I see I your point. Know. Maybe he just really likes the seven too. I don't know. Well, I'm going to tell you what, Kristen, when I sit okay. down at the great game pop on a table and I see someone who clearly doesn't know what they're doing, men, yeah. man, woman, child, old guy, young guy, whatever, yes. I'm three batting the shit out of them and I'm raising them. I'm isolating to all their limbs. So I want to let you know, I am equal opportunist at the great game pop on a table. I'm going yes. after everybody. Okay. I don't Alex care who we are. Yes. He's I, like, I wasn't three betting you because you're a girl. He's like, I three bet everybody. And then I sat and watched him play for a bit. And I'm like, okay, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You're like, all right, this dude is a fucking psychopath. He's going, he's, yeah. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I try to There was like no a, soft playing going on. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how you run up those big stacks, right? Yeah. Very interesting, interesting topic. I mean, I'd be interested to hear, uh, you know, we got a lot of women out there that are, they're giving their opinions up there these days and that have platforms and have voices. So yeah. I feel like it's an issue that is, I mean, one person talked about how the world series of poker numbers are much higher for the online events than there are for the live events that are happening in America right now. And okay. I found that quite interesting. And obviously it kind of makes it, it's interesting in that it shows that there are clearly women that are interested in playing these events. Also, they are lower buy-ins. So it is yeah. easier to play. I can I can see different sides of the argument, but you would imagine that maybe there would be, I don't know. It seems weird, right? Doesn't that seem Does that seem weird, or does that seem different? Like, I, I don't I don't I don't really know. That's interesting. It is interesting. I don't know either. I mean, it it's a topic. Again, my opinions are not very strong either way. I'm I'm. It's a very weird topic, and I don't like to have like a, you know, this is my standpoint, and I'm sticking to it. I'm mm -hmm. very flexible. I understand the women who say they're uncomfortable. I feel bad for them. I understand all sides to it. I think that, you know, men can be jerks. Women can be jerks. The biggest fights I've seen are in ladies events, legitimately. What? Like I saw a woman throw a card protector at another lady and then she went over and tried to punch her. I've never seen people get physical <laughs> at a poker table before and it was a female. So. And um, her name? I don't know. This what? is like at Turning Stone 12 years ago in the wow. ladies event. I don't know who else was there. I can't have, remember. Have, has at a ladies event, has there ever been a player who threatened to uh, punch someone against the wall and beat them up and then stick their the teeth in the, in the anus? Has that ever happened before too? Wow. Dana Negrano style. You ever seen that? With Dana, Dana Negrano recently said that on a stream. You see that? No. You missed it? Okay, you're you're good. I this did is not good. See that. I'm not I even gonna own... tell you about this then. No, no, if you ain't seen it, I ain't gonna tell you about it. But negrano has been handling his I mean, listen, he's been handling his but I think this may actually was a commenter, maybe it wasn't another opponent. I think it was actually re reserved for the chat, but it's just interesting. I feel like I've never seen that at the poker table too. So this whole streaming era of poker has really opened up some new banter able to be made from player to fan, from player to other player too. Yeah, that's crazy. I don't know. I think the society in general, there's so much political correctness that I tend to go the, a little bit the other way of like, you know, emotions are emotions and poker is an emotional game. And I kind of like that about poker. Like the other day we were watching clips of Phil Hellmuth, like rants and freak outs. And like, it's fun. Like that's, I don't know. No. There's a didn't. line. No, yes. we did. I love yes. that guy. His reactions. I love watching that dude's older outburst. It's he so just... funny. It's I know. It's great. Yeah. It's, so, okay. Because so... we all... We all feel like that on the inside, right? When we're playing poker, mm -hmm. like to some extent, we're like, oh my God, this guy is so lucky, whatever it might be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly how you mo you get emotionally bent up out of shape a little bit. But guys, shout out to everybody watching right now, guys. We got a bunch of people watching right now. Appreciate everybody tune in live. We got a bunch of people in the chat. I'll give a few shout outs real quick. Mr. M says, cue the Doug video. If you want to find this, technically it's on my YouTube channel right now. Broke it down yesterday. Yaha Yeet, interesting name. What's up, buddy? Jack Nolan. Gauntlet 14, what's up, Gauntlet? Brian McBride, what's up, Bobby? What's going on, brother? Mick Partridge Boy, okay, I like that name. Uh, I'll have another interesting name. Fwenif Noll says, big love from Copenhagen, Denmark. Shout out to Fwenif Noll. Do you have some shout outs you want to give, Krista? Maybe you want a shout out out there? Show some love to somebody? No, everybody watching. Everybody, everybody. you want to give a shout out to everybody, everybody watching. Yeah, I don't know who's watching. I can't see the, the chat. I don't know if any of my friends or family is watching, but... 
Well, now what you're do doing you a lot of interviews. They maybe they stop watching after you do. I this is conversation technically, but you do a lot of them, so maybe they tune in for the first three and then they stop watching the next ones. Exactly. That probably yeah. happened out there. I see my boy Checkmark okay. Pico Johnson out there, Mr. Checkmark man. I got one commenter that always responds with a checkmark at the end of his sentences. Oh, interesting. What kind of person do you think responds to every sentence with a checkmark at the end? I don't know. He might have a little bit of OCD. Yeah, he, I think he might. His house might be really clean. Yeah. He's probably a nit. Probably. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He's the kind of guy I'd probably three bet a lot. I think if I yeah, if me house, too. If someone was chatting with a lot of check marks, chat three bet, three bet, three bet. I mean, yeah. Me listen. too. So let's get back to some of these, uh, you know, kind of more poker related stuff. And I guess when when you're transitioning from lot online to live from cash to tournaments what kind of advice would you potentially give to people out there who are trying to make that transition from cash to tournaments um i think hmm. what i was saying before is like don't underestimate the complexity of tournament poker and understand that you probably have so many concepts you need to learn you know like and analyzing i guess um you're gonna get in situations with so many different stack sizes and uh, there's a lot of learning to do with that. And ICM, I, I've made a lot of ICM mistakes in my life and mm -hmm. still do. I, I, that's a concept that kind of uh, a, a hate relationship, I guess. ICM. <laughs> it's such a weird thing. It's like, uh, it's like I have to fold aces because of ICM. I mean, not actually aces, but I don't know. I kind of hate that that part of tournament poker sometimes it's a frustrating thing right like some sometimes you play some hands that you you then you can't play once you're in the money yeah. situations right yeah like you're just like i i know that you know this guy's shoving 80 percent, and i still have to fold it's like it, it feels bad in a way and they, and they, it's just an adjustment. Yeah, they've proven that with the, with the icm formula right so how do we know that that formula is accurate or not that's a good question i don't know but that's a really good question I'm not sure. I guess we're all just trusting these these people behind it. I'm right. sure and, of I, it. and that's what I would wonder too. And, and I'm sure like I had Ike on the other other week, uh, had I, Hollywood Haxon on and he yeah. broke down ICM in a very, 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 very deep, complex way. And I was like, wow, okay, that's interesting, right? So it goes deep, three minutes, he's going on about ICM yeah. and future game simulation. And that's what I would wonder is that, how do we know that? And I'm sure some people out there have answers to this question and they they broke it down. I think I'm gonna have, I think the co-creator is Mason Malmuth I'm gonna have on my show. So I'll be able to ask him and he's a mathematician by, he's a, for, you know, he's a real smart guy. He knows about all this kind of stuff, been playing poker, writing cool. books since the eighties. So this is the guy to ask this question to. So I'm very interested to see what he says about it because so kind of, so transitioning is just paying attention to stack sizes, trying yeah. to understand the differences in strategies and then understanding ICM. Yeah, and I think um, if you want to be a successful tournament player, fighting for pots, paying attention, I think that that's like, you know, underrated poker advice these days, especially in live, live poker, you know, everybody with the cell phones. I think that's like the number one thing if I was to give any poker player advice, it's like pay attention to, to your players. And, and there's so much focus on playing this like solver based poker that I think that we've gone a little too far of understanding. I mean, it sounds like you're saying like, oh, if this person sits down and an unexperienced person sits down, I'm three betting them. It's like some people might not three bet a hand you three bet because they're like, well, the solver says that's a fold. Well, it's like, well, no, but that's versus like a different player. <laughs> this is versus like, you know, come up with a cool name for a beginner. I don't know, like amateur Andy, you know, we can three bet him. <laughs> I know you like to do that. Double A. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, wait a second, all of a sudden our ranges look a little bit different than this like robotic, you know, unexploitable poker machine told us to do. So I don't know. I think that don't, don't steer too far away from, um, you know, the great game of poker in the sense of like playing the player. So you're talking about like a 2010 three bet, right? Like a 2008 call pre-flop. Yeah, maybe. Gavin, a, Gavin, a Gavin Smith flat call, AKA pocket kings or seven douche. You never know what he's got. Maybe, maybe. I mean, he, listen, that guy, Gavin Smith, you know, shout RIP Gavin Smith. He was one of the first uh, content creators for teaching poker. And he was also innovative in that he understood. Oh, I didn't know that. He understood, he made some videos where he talked about the flat call and he talked about how sometimes he'd look down to pocket kings, he flat calls. Other times he looks down at the seven deuce, he flat calls. 
He wants you to keep his range as wide as possible. Huh, interesting, okay. And now, he, I believe him to be the kind of player who would do the, that thing, so I don't think he was trying to put up a front or anything like that, too. But yeah. that may be an extreme version of the idea of balance, though. You might not want to go seven deuce. Maybe Alex goes yeah. seven deuce to, to get these chips. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know. that's kind of what they do. What what parts of your game do you feel like you need you need to work at right now that could use some improvement? Uh, probably ICM. ICM <laughs> and yeah. uh, understanding ICM a little bit better. And hmm. I'd say I'm just trying to improve. Well, one thing for sure, and we've touched on it a little bit, is like mental game versus very good players. I think that that's something that is as you're moving up stakes, I mean, you probably know what that's like. It's like when you move up in cash games, all of a sudden you're like, wow, like you have this fear of folding in a spot because you don't want to be exploitable at like the high stakes. And you might feel like, you know, a little afraid to lose a buy and all of a sudden at like a higher level that you're playing. And mm -hmm. I think just uh, for me, trying to improve my uh, like confidence in, in a higher stakes setting to be able to, I, I don't know, um, I guess play my my confident A game. Yeah, that's it. When, when tough there's thing. a little bit more pressure, yeah, because sometimes it's like um, playing in. It's such a silly thing, but let's say when hundred Ks happen, it's like they're so rare that you put all this pressure on yourself. But it's one tournament, right? So like the chances of one tournament going well are very very low. But it still like feels so shitty when it doesn't. And I think just trying to accept like, okay, I'm going to take a shot in the hundred K it might work out. It might not, but that's okay. And not be like crushed by it. Mm -hmm. That's something that's, that I'm definitely trying to kind of like come to terms with if I'm going to push myself to play higher and things like that. I mean, that, this is probably my biggest thing that held me back from uh, to getting to 25, 50 and above consistently was just like, I got a little mind fucked by losing a bigger buy-in against yeah. players who I perceive to be better, even though you'd be playing with a recreational player still in the game too. So, but I could, I, I couldn't really grab, I, it really hurt to to lose, you know, use five buy-ins, you're down 25,000. Like that was hard to deal with. And that was something that I never really overcame past that point. So I can yeah. understand exactly what you're saying. And I guess that's the part that separates a lot of those guys and a lot of those girls that are at these stakes is that they're able to have that. They just don't see it that way. They're able to, and I guess it's like having less emotion potentially, or just yeah. understanding being so educated and just having such an understanding of how the game works and how buy-ins work that you can detach yourself from the monetary meaning of that. And uh, you can detach yourself from the pressure of playing against these great players and I'm sure this has held a lot of people back from even getting to one, two to two, five, right? So we're talking about it at a high stakes level, but mm -hmm. I imagine this happens to people at a very low stakes level too. So I don't think this is ne necessarily exclusive. It's all relative to the games and stakes that you're playing. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Be interesting, me, right? How do people yeah. overcome that? I'm very curious to see how people would overcome that. Yeah. Right. Whether they maybe tell themselves something or they reframe the problem in a different way or yeah. uh, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that should be a new question for me to ask. For me, it's something that's helped me. I work with um, I work with Elliot Rowe and Jared Tendler, but mm -hmm. I think that what I'm a big fan of is is like visualizing the day and visualizing like okay, I'm in a spot versus whatever player, and just understanding like the emotions that might come up. Like oh, maybe this person's better at this spot than I am. They you know they understand how to exploit me. Are they exploiting me? And understanding to you know, remove all any sort of emotion that's not helping me make like a rational decision. And um, yeah, I don't know, I think preparing yourself mentally is very big and understanding, you know, wh when you sit down at the poker table, you have all of the tools that you have and all the knowledge you have. And basically, the best you can do is like, using that the best you can. And if you have emotions that are too high, it's gonna, you know, limit your decision making ability so mm -hmm. being able to be like okay i'm going to harness all of the the knowledge that i have and try to eliminate all the emotion that's nonsense and i think just kind of going in with with that frame of mind every session i'm doing this my next session when i when i go when i go battle in the pot of streets this week yeah yeah to just be like you know what i get in the hand versus whoever it might be and i'm just going to make the best decision i can and i don't need to feel like afraid to fold versus him or afraid to you know how many times when you move up stakes it's like uh, i don't know you get yourself in a weird situation and you're afraid to fold to someone because you think they're capable of having a lot of bluffs but they just have it like right. 
and you know that like all of your instincts and everything about the hand you're like they probably just have it but then there's that little bit of fear of being like well you're not good enough to play here well this guy's exploiting you mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you put your chips in really badly yeah that's uh definitely something i mean bernardo in the chat says yeah it's happening to me i'm crushing mid stakes but can't handle losses at mid stakes right i mean that's that's how it goes yeah. it's like you can be winning in these games too but the losing impacts you so much that you're not necessarily you can't overcome it and, and it, yeah. it, it crushes you so hard where you can't play for days i've, I've worked with a couple of people in the past who they've had that same issue and i would say well let's see your graph and the graph is a pretty straight up graph relatively but some of those losing days can really impact them and really really yeah. mess with their mental game very hard yeah yeah you can't you can't neglect your mental game of poker because it's you know i don't think i know anybody who can't benefit from putting in a little bit of work mm -hmm. what what qual i remember i asked this question on twitter i got some very entertaining answers what do you think the qualities of a of a successful tournament player are um i think being very competitive like mm -hmm. wanting to win all the pots that you can win because i think it, you know the format that tournaments are for the most part maybe the main event you know being patient is a little bit better but at the same sense it's like you you need to have that desire to win all the pots that you can win i, I really think that when you see the best tournament players that's something they're doing they're not just like you know giving up their big blind easily they're battling so i think being really competitive and seeing it as a battle i think um being able to be emotionally strong mm -hmm. and you know go from chip leader to 10 big lines and still be able to grind out those 10 big lines with like determination and uh not giving up i think being uh adaptable like what i was saying playing your opponent mm -hmm. and um probably being going into like the first thing i think being a little bit fearless is important in tournament poker i think um you know, being able to put all your chips in when you might be beat or you think they're going to fold. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then at the same time, a good level of patience and discipline. Yeah. And um, I think just being really mentally tough to like all the tough breaks and understanding variance and being a tournament poker player is so hard. Like mm -hmm. if you're trying to make money and pay like monthly bills, it's tough. I, it's really, really tough because, you know, you could, potentially be playing pretty well and uh, have unlucky spots. And then speaking to that, I think, you know, all of poker, but look for the spots you can improve on. Like, don't just, don't just settle for being like, oh, I busted this tournament because I got two outer and this happened. It's like, don't, who cares about all those normal hands? Like try to find spots, try to watch better players than you try to improve in any way you can to like, to see where you can win chips because that's what's more important right like we all know how to play ace king preflop and pocket aces and things like that and it's like where could where did you maybe lose value in hands where did you you know lose too many chips you could have saved chips mm -hmm. things like that like what spots are you missing and i think that a lot of people in poker are too complacent or like almost overly confident in their game where they don't want to constantly improve. And the best players that I've spoke to, they're the ones who are always looking to like, you know, step it up a notch and find find any spots to make more chips or play more profitably. Yeah, that's real great stuff. Yeah. Jack Nolan, big, big up for the free content. So much info is behind a paywall. So it's nice to have people at such a high level willing to share for those who don't have a coach. I agree, Jack. I mean, there's a lot of information out there these days. I mean, I think that what you said, right? We, we always need to rehear these things because we might know these intuitively or if you think yeah. about it, write it down, you might come to these kind of conclusions. But oftentimes there's so much information being thrown at us from all different angles, not only in poker, but outside of that, that you need reminders of these things and of these fundamental qualities that are yeah. needed because sometimes you just forget, right? Sometimes you forget, hmm, maybe I'm not being very fearless and maybe I'm not fighting for these pots and maybe my mindset is a little messed up right now because of I, I've been losing for a couple of weeks and I can't execute the strategy, which I believe to be correct because I've had some bad variants and I'm that that's happens to a lot of players out there and even regulars yeah. as well too. You, that's why resetting, taking time off. Yep. Refreshing your mind, getting rid I'm of that. I'm learning that. that. <laughs> GBGBs GB in your mind. Yep. Do you, guys, do you do much of that? I, didn't, I mean, you're a grinder, right? But are you taking yeah. much time off? Or are you are you are you having some time off for yourself here? I'm I'm. That's probably my biggest struggle with poker is balancing. Like, often days when I take time off, I feel a little guilty and I feel like afraid that I'm going to forget how to play poker. Mm -hmm. And so I'm learning that 
the benefits of having a day where, you know, I can organize my life, uh, whatever it might be doing other things and understanding like, oh, wait a second. You know, when I take Saturday off all of a sudden on Sunday, I'm like hungry and I'm way more excited to play than if I'm just like grinding every day and it becomes kind of like routine. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think, I think some time off is very valuable, but I know for myself and I'm guessing you're somebody who's like this. I know Alex is like this too. It's like during a downswing, all I want to do is play and get out of it. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Which yeah. might not be the best approach because normally in a downswing, you're not necessarily playing your best. Exactly. So I'm trying to understand like, okay, it's okay to take a day off. There's no rush to get out of the downswing or grind it out. Like, let's be smart about it. But yeah, it's hard. What I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a whole thing. I could go on for hours about that whole, yeah, that whole mindset there. Uh, Steven asked about the, the COVID-19 uh, tournament. So how has the poker world from your perspective changed with the quarantine and, and with lockdown and with more people maybe coming to online poker? Um, well, it seemed, it was really crazy at first because it was kind of booming. Um, and to be fair, I, I feel like a lot of the tournaments I've played in, it seems like I've seen a lot of players I've never seen before. And like the games seem pretty good. Um, I guess I'm interested to see what live poker is going to be look, look like in a year from now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think online poker you know, I don't really attract what's going on outside of what I'm playing. It seems like it's still alive and well. I know, you know, there's pretty good turnouts in the tournaments I've been in. So I don't know. It, yeah, it'll well, be interesting to see what's going to happen in a year. Yeah, it does seem like here here in Vegas, GTO headquarters, they're having the tables eight-handed now. I, you know, it's funny. I feel like I, I, I went and played shorthanded PLO a few times, and I was like, oh, my God, you know. Right. But, and I said, maybe I should play more of this, right? Like my specialty six max PLO cash is coming to, coming to town. But then I, you know, the, the fear, the, all the fear mongering out there kind of got to me a little bit. So I'm like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I'll work on these other things, which actually is more beneficial long-term, but now they're coming eight handed here. So I say, eh, maybe I missed out a little bit. So it does seem like yeah. more and more places are coming back to full ring. And I imagine that as time goes on here, as people start to get it, as it goes through the system, as more of these vaccines are developed that we'll see. But now the question is, will those people return even after they get a vaccine due to this perception that they're, they, they can't get any illness or something might happen or they don't want to be around people or I'm yeah. sure some people have been locked inside for a while to the point where they, they might have just adopted these new at-home habits that they don't even want to go outside much anymore, sure. which is probably yeah. what we're seeing a lot. Like it's so entertaining to be in your own world at home with all the uh, the Netflix out there, you can watch any TV shows, yeah. you can play games. We're in these fantasy worlds. So why would you want to go outside for some people? They don't, they don't necessarily miss that yeah. human interaction. Definitely. So I, yeah, I wonder what's going to happen with the live stuff. I mean, are you planning to play live if it comes back? Or are you going to play right away? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't feel like I'm at a big risk group. I feel, um, yeah, I would feel, I would feel comfortable playing live again. And I miss live poker. So I, yeah. I definitely, uh, We'll go back. Joe Rutten says, thoughts on GG only obliging certain players to play under real name for World Series Poker. So what's happening, it seems like on GG Poker, is there's some players who have to play on their real screen names. Other yeah. players were able to play on aliases. And I don't know if there's much rhyme or reason behind why is what or what is why, why what's going on there. Yeah, I think, um, well, the other day on the final table, everybody's name got changed to the real name on the final table. Okay. But I definitely feel like it's not fair that some people have to play under their real name and some people don't. I, I think that's, hopefully they're going to transition that, that everybody has to, because it's just not fair to somebody like myself. I have to play, even though my, my screen name is Chris CB24. Anyway, that you know it's me. But yeah, I think that it is a little bit, I, I think they're, they're in the right place and they're heading the right direction. It's obviously not as simple, I imagine, to just have to change everyone's screen names like right away. But yeah, it seems to be one element a party party and implemented that where people play on their real yeah. names now in all these tournaments, so you know who you're playing against. Do you do you like that better, or do you like seeing uh, you know tr tr Tree Man forty eight and 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 fuck you eighty five and like some sort of coded word yeah. where you don't know it's them? <laughs> yeah, I um I like. I like the real names now, you know, it, the poker world, or at least like on party poker, it changed already. Like, remember on poker stars, you know, Chicago Joey was you like he, Tim Stone is one. Mm -hmm. These are names that you're, you're mentioning two yeah, people that I know. said who they were. Maybe who about, Dan what about Dankness three? My yeah, man, my it, man, Dank, Daddy Dank. Like, 
Exactly. Somebody, somebody's name who is like, even though it's not, their name's not in their screen name, we know it's them or like they've built, you know, when Party Poker had it that, you know, all of a sudden, I don't know, like Wushu, he's someone, uh, I forget his screen name, Wushu TM or whatever. It's like, we all knew he was Thomas Mulocker and I don't know if I'm butchering his name. I'm sorry if I am, but, uh, you know, once he got to change his name to whatever, Riley 24, it was like, nobody, I didn't know who anyone was and I never did. And I don't know. I think that having an ability to change the screen names once kind of ruined it. Like this happened on party poker. I forget exactly why, but, um, when everyone changed their screen names and it's like random. And then obviously these like stables and people who are really watching the lobbies and tracking the games and analyzing statistics, they have such an advantage over, you know, somebody like me, admittedly, I'll just sit down and play a session once a week like back in the day and it's like i don't know who anyone is and i'm not spending the time trying to figure that out mm -hmm. so yeah personally i like real names i think that it adds a level of i don't know it's, it's kind of cool too with like google and the internet now that you can google who you're playing versus i think that's kind of interesting i can understand some people not liking that but for the most part it's like why not i don't know be able to see their poker results or you know, yeah, let me tell you a funny story okay so i, I okay. was uh I've been testing out, I'm looking for opportunities outside of poker to either uh, work with or invest or consult with or work with. Yeah. Uh, so I've been testing out these uh, like free money, like, like free poker games just to see what okay. their software's like, what their implementation's like, what their structure for monetization's like. And I went and played, uh, I think it was called like Gov Gr Governors of Poker 3, okay? And uh, so I make my name like just my name. <laughs> and then I go in there, I go to a table and I, I like throw like a, I throw an emote at someone, like clearly a couple players that knew who they were. And the guys in the chat's like, be careful about who you throw an emote, emote with. Be careful who you say that to, through that to, or you beat in a pot. We can find you on the internet. <laughs> I'm like, what the wow. Wow. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. You're like being threatened. Yeah. I'm being it's threatened in the, in the uh, lowest stake, free money <laughs> uh, platform out there. And I was like, oh, it's an interesting experience. Yeah. So I could see the other side of the whole real money debate. If you beat a guy of a pot, all of a sudden he's Googling you and looking you up and saying, oh, it's Kristen McNell. I'm going to, has that ever happened to you where you beat someone out of a pot and they sent you a, th a threatening message said they're going to, something crazy. Has that ever happened? I have not seen any threatening messages. No, okay. but I might've gotten them. I don't read all my messages, so. Yeah, you know, probably, so, probably. Yeah. Uh, Freddie Gonzalez, I'm curious what opportunities outside of poker has has being a successful poker player presenter. Yeah, what kind of opportunities? So yeah, so obviously you're building a name now. You're known as a, a great poker player. You've been a good ambassador for party. So are there companies hitting you up saying, hey, we want to work with you or sponsor you or anything like that? Uh, no, not really. No. I no, I don't think maybe I've gotten some offers for like poker gear, like t-shirt companies, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm, has there been anything else? I don't think so. Maybe like some charity stuff. Yeah. But kind of poker related that right. they were they trying want you to, to show yeah. up or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I yeah. get I get things like that all the time. I mean, I think if you're you, I guess you don't keep as much, maybe you're not networking as much or talking to people as much. A lot of those opportunities come from just knowing people and saying, yeah. hey, maybe if you have something, let me know. Because I always get sure. a lot of business offers and event offers and company all the time. That's so interesting. Yeah. yeah you always That's get people cool. wanting to put you in, in this event or just because they want the support. They can say, oh, this person's coming or that person's coming. So it looks good for the event too. So it's like a mutually beneficial value yeah. exchange where you could awesome. potentially play an event for free and you get to meet people and you get to have a good time and they get to say that you came and you know, everybody win wins. So sure. Kinda, seems cool. to be, seems to be how it works out, works out. Can I take a two second bathroom break? Of course. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah okay. I'll get some shout outs. Gonna... Hey, okay. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Let go me ahead. Do that. I'll be right, right back. Go ahead. Let me I'm going to stop outs. this video for a sec. Who we got out there in the chat, my people, Marco all in puppy. What's up, buddy. Nice to see you, Marco. Nicola. Ila, Ila, Vis, Ila, Ila, Vesky, Ila, Ve look at these names. I mean, how do you say this guy's name? Look at his name, seriously. Nikola, Ila, Ili, Ivsky, Il, I, Io, Vesky, Il, Vesky. What's up, buddy? What's happening? Steve Mullen, what's the largest buy in tournament you'd be comfortable playing with no action sold? You too, Joey. Listen, I'd be comfortable playing a 10K buy in event with no action sold, something like the main event. I'd be comfortable with that. Why not? Who do we got? 
Robert Katarina, what's up, Robert? What's happening? Zaminski, Binks, Poppy, what's going on, buddy? Albert K, Joey, you are ours now. You're right, I am yours. Let's go. Uh, hyphen, hyphen, what's up, buddy? Thank you for calling me sexy earlier. I appreciate that. CSAP12, what up, Joe? What's happening? Jason McDonald, he must be a 5K Challenge fan. Joey, pizza in the house. Pizza, pizza. Oh, oh my God. All was, right, I'm back. What did you, what did you, what did you have? Balcony, what happened there? That was, little, that was quick. <laughs> There's just a bathroom right there. Oh my God, yeah, that was like the quickest, quick. I mean, that was the quickest I've ever seen in my life. I mean, listen, I don't know what's going on there. Okay. What? <laughs> Rob Palmer, what's up? What's up? What's happening? I'm trying to pronounce this name. I was having some trouble with it, but I don't know if you'd be uh, Gauntlet 4, Shop from Bucharest. What's up, Pompey? What's happening? Oh, cool. What's happening? A lot of people out there in the chat. A lot of people showing up here. People showing up for the podcast. My content's awesome. back. We're, we've been doing some podcasts more. You haven't been paying attention to anything in poker, right? So you haven't paid attention to the Doug Polk versus, versus uh, Coke and Dan, Dan Negreanu sort of thing going back and forth with those two, right? I only have the gist of the situation. I saw clips of Daniel Negreanu freaking out, and then I saw that Doug Polk had made a video, but I didn't watch it. And then Yeah, I, I mean, it's you. just like a video meant to, you know, make, make the guy look a little bad meant to make yeah. fun of some things that he was involved with in the past that aren't going to necessarily make him look positive to certain people. And I guess I wonder in that is like, at what point in time do you, do you move on from something like this? Right. At what point in time do yeah. positive as a person does and, and the way they try to represent themselves now, you know, at what point do things that happened in the past and decisions that they made in the past and debatably potentially mistakes they've made in the past, do people get over that? Or do you just keep bringing it up for the rest of the time? It seems like <laughs> the standard now in social media is like people just keep bringing these things up if they want to for forever <laughs> never goes yeah, away any any mistake you made is going to be amplified by people who don't like you for yeah. eternity the internet is just such easy access for people behind a computer screen to kind of go off with their negative you know tangents or being a hater it's, it's unfortunate i think you know mm -hmm. that's i i mean like what i was saying you know the small amount that i've experienced it that you know, the, the thing with the final table with Alex, it's like every single thread that I'm myself for him is posted. It's like, that will come up <laughs> or, you know, he had this stupid lawsuit um, and people try bringing that up whenever his name comes up. I don't know. Unfortunately, people like to hate on successful people. Right. Yeah. I mean, people like to hate on uns unsuccessful people as well, too. It seems like, sure. right. There, there, there are no, there's no border boundary yeah. for the. I mean, you know, it's funny. I remember uh, yesterday, went to the Grand Canyon, right? And we, they, they, the package that they sold, my, my mother, my parents, not necessarily the package that was promoted on, on the thing, right? They yeah. promised these things that didn't happen. So oh, no. this is really funny. We're all wearing Grand Canyon shirts, right? So my parents like outrage, you know, it's kind of like a crazy, uh, you see this on Twitter. If this was on Twitter, it'd go viral on Twitter for like the outrage she had. I mean, it's no social distancing, not quite the accommodation they expected. So they're storming off the bus. They're yelling, they're creating a scene. I go, oh my God, what the fuck is happening? This is embarrassing, no. right? And uh, this lady on the bus is like, ha ha, you guys aren't going to be able to go to the Grand Canyon. So I didn't see this. And I was like, man, that's real. First of all, it's like kind of, you know, like, why are people that rude and mean to each other? Yeah. And then we saw them at the Grand Canyon and my mother goes out of her way. Just like, hey, there you are. We just saw you on the bus. And she's like, I'm like, mom, what the fuck are you doing? But this is like the, and, and she's like, oh, I'll show her. I go, where does this come from, right? Where does this like emotion to got to like get yeah. back at the other, like, this is kind of what happens on social media. It seems like is these people are just the same exact way. It's like, ha, you're wrong. I'm going to tell you in this and that. And yes, maybe it's best to avoid it. It seems like you do a pretty good job avoiding these kind of things. You stay out of the drama. You're not necessarily paying attention to, to, to what's happening. You're just kind of yeah. focused on your game and what you're doing. Yeah, I'm too busy. I'm just sitting here grinding, grinding the games. <laughs> just playing poker, having a good time. Yeah. So your hobbies outside of that, you yeah. spend time with your boyfriend, try to eat healthy, try to work out healthy. Do you have any other sort of things you're spending time on or are you basically? Uh, especially right now, it's basically that. Like we, we're talking about maybe doing a road trip in Canada because we, we can't go, even leave the country right now because then I guess Alex can't come back in. So yeah. uh, we're, we're kind of stuck in Canada at the moment. So we might do like a road trip. I, I really like traveling. I love going to restaurants, things like that. But no, I mean, we're just kind of going for walks, working out, trying to stay healthy. I don't know what, once stuff goes back, I was just about to sign up for some dance classes that oh. unfortunately, unfortunately didn't run because of the quarantine stuff. So I'm kind of anxious for that. Cause I wanted to get into that. That's something I've always wanted to do. And I was like, why don't I just do it now? Oh, we're golfing. That's what we took up is golf. Golfing. So, yep. What, what, kind of, um, what kind of dance do you want to get into? 
Uh, definitely like Latin America, like Latin American, like salsa, whatever. Okay. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a proficient dancer. I love dancing. I have not studied salsa, but I, I have studied other dancing. So I Ooh. I love, you know, we used to have dance offs on the, on, the, on the podcast back in the day. That was pretty no fun. No way. Were, those what were kind fun. of dance? What kind of dance? Do you uh, mainly like hip, hip hop related dance. Okay. And cool. then like I watch because I, I, I used when I before when I downloaded TikTok, they're always dancing on there. So like you just can't help but want to dance. I, and I always dance before yeah. that, too. So after I started watching all these crazy people on TikTok doing the dances, then I just like I got even more into the dancing, too. But then That's I deleted awesome. it because, you know, there's all these things about TikTok. I just decided I, I don't want to be involved with TikTok. Yeah, I've heard it's not good. I, I, yeah. Who knows if any of them are good, right? Who, who knows? <laughs> what any of them but are. yeah, I love Spanish music. I have a weird affinity for, I don't know what they're saying, but I love the beat of that music. You know what they're saying? It's like, <laughs> just makes me want to dance. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's Alex cool. made fun of me. He's like, got all the same songs. That's what they're doing. They are all the same. Right? Anytime you yeah. go by like a, 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 Span like a, Mex a Spanish place here and, and yeah. they're playing Spanish music or Latin music in Vegas, it's all... It all sounds the same. Sounds beat. that way. It's yeah. all the same. But it makes me happy. It makes me want to dance to it. I yeah. like it. <laughs> I like it too, man. I like it too. Let yeah. me get a couple more questions for people up there cool. and then we'll wrap things up here. Do you have any advice for someone maybe if they want to uh, study tournaments, right? You have a place you might guide them or some piece of advice and how to get better for, for anyone out there that might be sure. wondering what um, to do? Uh, I think... Um, one thing I really like to do, I love to watch poker. I think that you you learn a lot from that. There's like, you know, Poker Go, you can watch live poker. Even on YouTube, you can watch the replays from the tournaments. Mm -hmm. I personally think playing a lot really, really helps. I think that if you're playing with the frame of mind to learn and you're actively, you know, trying to understand why did this person do that? Why, why should I do this? You know, why is raising here good? I think asking why right in poker just whether you're watching someone and wondering why they're doing it you can learn like oh this person three bet with this hand but like maybe you should understand why mm -hmm. and I, I so i think that that's a big question i think uh there's tons of good resources i i poker code run it once is it yeah um i don't know I always, I it all blends together it all blends together yes so there's lots of training sites but i think you know if you could find maybe like find somebody grinding what you're grinding and sharing information with them and talking to them, you know, seeing what is the expression success leaves clues. Mm -hmm. So find the people who are successful and, you know, try to see what, how did they get there and what are they doing that works? And right. well, one thing I see poker players, they want going back to the negative thing. They want to say like, Oh, this person sucks. Like, this, they did this mistake, they suck. But it's like, don't, you're limiting your learning process if you're just gonna view other players that way. Like try to see what other people do good. And I think trying to, or understanding why they did something, right? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes, sometimes fish do really clever things that work really, really well. <laughs> and maybe you can incorporate that into your game if you understand it. So I think that for me, I just think have, have the big question mark of why and really just dig in deep. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. Very important to stay mindful about that in game. And of course, yeah. it can be challenging to do that when you're in the heat of battle and you're paying attention to something else or if your focus is away from the game too. It's hard yeah. to really take note on terms of why somebody did something like that. I mean, I even, I fall victim to that too when I'm playing. You might just check yeah. out for a while and not pay much attention to what's happening too. Yeah. So yeah, that's definitely an important thing for people to, to get to light up here. Uh, do you have any podcast guest recommendations you think I should have on? Do you have any people that you think that would make good pot, good guests or someone you think would be interesting right now? Maybe an up and coming player, maybe someone that no one knows much about, or is there anyone that you're personally interested in? Um, let me just think for a minute because I don't have someone off the top of my head. I think... <laughs> I have a really big interest, you know, I always listen to people's podcasts when they have like Elliot Rowe on, Jared Tenler on. I like mm -hmm. hearing people who expertise, their expertise is like in performance and coming from that mental game side to it. So I'm a little bit biased in, in really enjoying those types of podcasts and hearing, you know, good advice of how to get better, things like that. I think as far as players go, uh, is there anyone who interests me at the moment? Um, Nobody, hmm. no one, nobody interesting. Nobody. <laughs> They're no, all no. uninteresting to me now. <laughs> um, hmm. So yeah, I feel like here's some of my favorite 
You think about it. Okay. What about power yeah, rankings? Do you, do we got any power rankings? Maybe I know they love power rankings. The thing is these can be controversial. So if you don't want to give them and cause anyone to get real butthurt emotions, you don't okay. have to, but if you'd like to give some power rankings, maybe a top five, a top 10, a rough list, an order, whatever you'd want to give, people are always loving the, the, the power rankings. Okay, I don't know. I mean, I said that Arthur, he's been really like crushing this year and dominating. I think um, uh, some of my- Arthur, Mar Arthur, Ma Arthur Martirogian. Yeah, okay. yeah, he's he's tricky. He's fun to play with. He looks uh, tricky. Yeah. He's, he's this, guy, this guy, let me, this guy looks tricky. Let me show, let me show you what this guy looks like. Look at this guy. This is, a, <laughs> this is a face of a guy that looks tricky to me. No, you can't see it. The people at home, look at this guy. You tell me this guy's not tricky with that, that, look at this, look at this. I mean, this looks like a tricky guy to me. Okay. Right? Yeah. So Arthur Martirogian. Okay. What yeah, about Mike he's... Mattisau? Would you put Mike Mattisau on that top 10 list? <laughs> I played, I played a really, like right before, right before the quarantine, we went deep at Bay 101 together. I played a really crazy hand with him. Um, he's funny. I don't know. What's the crazy uh, hand? What happened to hand Mike Mattis out the mount? He, oh shit. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. I lost my sound for a second. Um, oh, what was the hand? Let me think. I had a flush and he had, let me just think how this hand fit out. He overplayed top pair versus my flush. I can't really remember the exact hand. And okay. then he was, he wasn't very happy about it, but I think he, to some extent, I think he fell victim to like not understanding that I was a girl who might know a little thing about poker. Oh, really? I think I could be wrong, mm -hmm. or maybe it's just Mike. I don't know. Maybe yeah. He says fuck GTO. He says he does not uh, adhere to GTO. He doesn't need to play GTO. He's been winning for fifteen years plus, and he doesn't need to worry about those type of things. So I don't yeah. know. Maybe he's got his oh. own style of play. <laughs> so going back to power rankings. Uh... So I don't know, Alex. I think Ollie's a really good player. Ali uh, M M Sher M Sher M Sherovich. Yes. M Sherovich. M yeah. Sherovich. Okay. Um, who else is there who's out on the streets a lot lately? Uh, what about some of your for, uh, your fellow party poker team members? Right, you got uh, Jordan. Do you play with BBZ Staking? Do you play with that guy at all? Jordan oh Drummond? yes, a little bit, a little bit. Um, who do I play a lot with? Jeff Gross, you play with him a lot? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know who else. <laughs> She's like, <annoying. She's> <laughs> She's like, I just play, all right? I sit down, I don't identify names. I don't even know who that yeah. anybody is. I just sit there and I grind and I play and I win the money. That's what I do, all right? That's exactly. It. That's exactly. not a bad approach tab. I like it, man. Yeah. <laughs> I like that approach a lot. I like that approach a lot. All right, I feel like we Thank covered you. a lot of really cool stuff, man. I appreciate Sweet. you coming on. and. Do you have anything else you might want to add? Any advice you might want to give to the people? Maybe a, a piece of, uh, you know, you gave some real good poker advice throughout. I think people can implement into their game and, and real stuff that maybe, you know, you don't, the way you say it, it might not sound important, but I think it is really important. A lot of things you're pointing yeah. out. And, uh, you know, if you can yeah. implement a lot of these things into your game that, that you can become more successful at life or at not yeah. just poker, but at anything that you do is, is you have a key set of fundamentals, how you might approach anything. So if you want to get better at anything, you can get better at, at those things the exact same way. Yeah, so, I think mm -hmm. I think just what I would reiterate is is like challenge yourself and have confidence in yourself and you know the quote like talent is overrated. I you know I'm definitely not the best poker player in the world, but I I work really hard. I'm sure I have some level of natural talent, mm -hmm. but for sure what what I excel at is uh persevering and not giving up and mm -hmm. not being discouraged. And I think, you know, going back to the conversation of women in poker, I think um, the one thing that I see limit women the most is a lack of confidence in poker and understanding like when you go into a casino, how many men suck at poker? Like it's okay to not have experience and to be, you know, Outrage. Be a, to be a student of the game. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so Are we allowed to say that? We can say men suck. I can't I can't say women suck, right? That would be out of line. Uh, men mm. men can suck women. Okay, I'm just making Some people suck at poker. <laughs> Some people suck at poker. <laughs> Some people figure are out where, where it lies. Am I on Twitter? Yeah. Am I on Instagram? Where am I at here? Am I in the real world? Where can I say these things? And you know, <laughs> each each part has to say a certain thing. Yeah. Poker is hard. Don't be so judgmental of other people. Don't be so judgmental to yourself. Just have fun with the game. And, you know, at the same time, 
it, it's a really fun thing when you can challenge yourself and give yourself opportunities to succeed and grow and push yourself. And I think that that's like my number one kind of motto in life. And um, I think that when I see people who struggle with poker, it's, you know, being discouraged and lacking confidence. And um, I, I think that so many people don't, I guess, like believe in themselves that they could, you know, achieve what they want to achieve. Or mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes we're, we're we are our own worst enemies and just ignore the noise. It's kind of like what I was saying. I just like to focus on what I'm doing and, you know, ignore the negativity. That's yeah. for sure. But I love that advice. I mean, that's applicable yeah. to what you do with, if you do that with content or do that with poker or do that with your business, that's incredibly applicable advice. And I, I like that a lot. And uh, yeah. SR says, Kristen, I love how much you emote. No one emotes like you <laughs> at, the, at the table. I don't know what that means. Does that mean that you, you are, I'm so, that means so much to me. No, I, <clears throat> so GG, you can use like emojis. Uh -huh. And so the other day, I think that like there was a stream of the final table, but I was using emojis a lot. So, so you could do like, you're all in, you do just one time. Or, <laughs> Thank you. Or like whatever. Nice play. Yeah. They, I, I really like the emojis. Yeah. So I like I, it on the site. I play it when I lose a pot, I throw the, the, the shit at them. Okay. Yeah. We don't have, I really hate that. So on party poker, they have that option and I get that thrown at me a lot. And I'm like, <laughs> what, kind, what kind of guy throws that at a girl? I think it's not very nice. Anyone can get it from me. I don't care if you're a man, woman, child, yeah. adult, animal, dog, anyone. If I think that you made a shitty play, I'm gonna throw that, I'm gonna throw that shit I don't like it. I don't like it. And then I told Alex, I don't like it. And then he gets on my table and he does it to me. And I throw, <laughs> him, I throw him kisses and he throws me like the pigeon shit. And I just think it's going <laughs> <laughs> That's, Wait, you can throw a kiss at somebody? Yeah, on party poker. What the hell? I mean, yeah. that's like some. Oh my god, there's like, there's like, there's like loving moments happening in the party poker chat. I didn't think about that. And you could like yes. make a, you could like make a moment with someone in the chat. And just what if someone just start throwing kisses at you relentlessly? Like kiss, kiss. I mean, can you block the kisses from them or what? Yeah. Well, I know in GG you have a limit, so like I'll use my emojis too much that I have like a timeout button for twenty you're, seconds you're, or something. You're like an emoji reg. Yeah. Okay. Uh, party poker, I think you can do unlimited, but there it takes a little longer to figure out which one you're selecting. So, anyways, yeah, I like when people throw me the nice ones. Oh. Well, maybe. <laughs> but I don't like the mean ones. I see it, the the woman in me gets offended. They get they get offended by the mean ones. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, we're gonna wrap it up. I'm gonna be back tomorrow. We got a World Poker Tour PLO Championship final table. I'm breaking it down. I did wow. commentary on it, so I, I know about it. I'm gonna be breaking down every, so Kristen might make a WPT final table. We're on alert, we're on high alert for any of the party poker pros, if they make it on there. Anyone who's a podcast guest, if they make a final table on party, we're gonna be really excited. So I'm gonna be doing all the WPT championship events coming up here. Uh, probably the 100K, 25K, I'll be having breakdowns of all these events on my channel. I'm excited about that. I've been learning more tournaments. These things are a really great resource to learn, Kristen, right? You get to watch how these players play and you wonder if they did a good play. Did They're that so play. good, yeah. When I'm studying these days, that's kind of what I'm doing. There's so much to review. And that's the beauty of right now with the, all the online pokers. There's there's good content. They're giving it away. I'm always like, I'm always adverse to how much I want to tell, like harp down on this over it. I'm like, you guys don't understand the opportunity you have right now, but then I'm like, eh, yeah. I won't be, I won't be like, a, I, won't, <laughs> I won't be overwhelming with uh, with what I got to yeah. say. So guys in the chat, you guys are enjoying it. Thank you very much. Wayne Chiang, Steve Mullen, Jason McDonald, Jonathan Magal, SR, M. Tonto, Alex Seven, love of your life. Joe afraid that if he wear, will wear a tank, then Chrissy will fall in love with him and Alex is going to punish him for that. That's exactly was my thought process when I was in there. Actually, I wore a queen of diamonds. Uh, I wore I wore a Queen of Diamonds shirt, and you're right. I was thinking about wearing the tank top, and then you know I knew that it would cause this big chain reaction when Alex is on the podcast here. Uh, probably next, I think it might be actually August or September. We're, we're uh, probably gonna do something with the chip leader coaching thing, and that, that's what I was afraid of. You're right. We were gonna wear a tank top. We're gonna have a tank top pool <laughs> on my show the next time he's on. So, but guys, that's it. Enjoyed it very much, Chrissy. Enjoyed very awesome. much talking with you. Finally on the show. It's been a long time coming. Thank yes. you very much. That's it. Peace out, everybody. Take care. Adios. Have a good day. Enjoy your Friday. Be back tomorrow.